gentle and of course very modern apes welcome back to another episode of the library of error where we take a look at pseudoscientific books and we assess them critically right now we're working our way through contested bones a pseudoscientific young earth creationist text written by christopher roop and john sanford that aims to overturn all of biological anthropology human evolution written by two guys who are not biological anthropologists or even anything adjacent to the subject. And if I seem a bit more bitter or angry than normal, uh, it's because I am. Today, we are going over the Australopithecus afarensis, or Lucy chapter. And this chapter represents a turning point for me in Contested Bones, and this was kind of re-solidified as I was reading over my annotations yesterday, because this is the chapter where I conclusively feel as though I can make the case that Sanford and Roop are not being ignorant, but they are being intentionally deceptive. And I know it sucks to hear me say that, and I know I say that seemingly more and more often on this channel, but it's very hard for me to square the amount of work done in this chapter, the amount of at least exposure to aspects of the literature, with the things that they're saying, with the conclusions that they're making and espousing, and the malice that they're imposing onto the scientific community. I find it irritating, I find it nefarious, and I hope to leave you with a similar impression. <laughs> As you can see, I'm surrounded by props that I've checked out from my university. Non-usual props anyways. They, we got our usual suspects up here and some over here, but we also have lots of pelvis, some long bones, femurs, uh, things of this nature. So this will aid us in our journey of assessing the critical representation of Australopithecus afarensis literature in this text. It's rough. I, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt and assume good faith, but it, it's tough with this one. So let's dive in. If you will recall, Contested Bones splits up all of the hominins into three categories because they are young earth creationists, so they believe that the earth was created 6,000 years ago with progenitor groups that humans did not descend from any of. We are our own group. And to them, this means that the hominin fossil record cannot be legit. And so the fossils therein fall into these three categories, the human hominin. So these are ones that they're just human. And when you're like, what does that mean? Does that mean homo sapiens? Does that mean within some kind of predetermined range of genetic or morphologic traits? Uh, I don't know what it means. I continue to not know what it means because they won't say, <laughs> because that leaves them open to debunking, doesn't it? The second category is the bones of the ape type. Now, if you hear that and you're like, <laughs> isn't that kind of like calling certain dog breeds bones of the dog type and bones of the canine type? And the answer is yes, humans are apes. We are members of the superfamily Hominoidea and the family Hominidae. There's no getting around that. Uh, these guys do not give us reason to believe that that is not the case. They present no arguments for that. They just kind of assume that you're okay with it. And then the last category of bones that contested bones creates is the bones of the middle type, which tell me that there are transitional fossils without telling me there's transitional fossils, right? They are too good. The transitionals have gotten too impressive, so they have to create this new category uh, where they basically, spoiler, chalk it up to either nefarious hoaxes on the part of the scientific community, or I kid you not, 
some kind of taphonomic scenario that actively mixes human and quote unquote ape bones. Take with that what you will. They start by saying the ape like hominin bones can all reasonably be placed within the genus Australopithecus. The genus appears to show a great deal of morphological variation, and so the partitioning of the genus into various species is controversial and unconvincing. The Australopithecus species are loosely referred to as the Australopithecines or Australopiths. Uh, it's going to be Australopiths. Australopithecine implies that there is a group called Australopithecinae, which there is not. The Australopithecus species are loosely referred to as Australopithecines or Australopiths. Taxonomic, taxonomic splitters would like to argue that the Australopithecines should be subdivided into two or more genera, and that Australopithecus itself should be divided into several species. Extreme splitters <laughs> would accept many of the following different Australopith-like species, uh, and then they list some of the conventionally ex accepted, like widely conventionally accepted species, including Artipithecus rabidus, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus barogazali, Australopithecus garhi, Australopithecus prometheus, that one's a little bit sus, and Australopithecus sediba. They say, in addition, they would add the robust gorilla-like Australopithecines and then, I kid you not, they say Australopithecus apiopicus, Australopithecus boisei, Australopithecus robustus. I haven't seen that designation in any recent literature because it is broadly accepted based off of the fossil evidence that Paranthropus is its own genus because they are so distinct. This is, this is ridiculous, trying to propose that these should all be an Australopithecus. They're saying that Artipithecus, this thing here, belongs in the same genus as Australopithecus, this thing here, which belongs in the same genus as Paranthropus, this thing here. These things are all very distinct, but particularly egregious is this bad boy right here. This thing is very, very, very morphologically unique when compared to Australopiths. And part of the reason is because one, look at it, and two, it's sexually dimorphic. So you cannot collapse both males and females of Paranthropus into Australopithecus, nor can you do the same with Artipithecus because Artipithecus has the opposite problem. It's not sexually dimorphic, it's monomorphic. So guys, what are we doing here? This says to me um, that we have not really looked into our morphology or the criteria for designating these species. However, lumpers, including ourselves, would argue that these subgroupings are based off of relatively minor morphological differences, often reflecting less difference, for example, than is seen in the bones of between a male and a female gorilla. Um, Yes, males and females in gorilla are very dimorphic, but they are about as dimorphic as Paranthropus is. So they want to take that level of diversity and collapse it into a broader species. That's not going to work. Um, the bones of the Australopiths are strikingly similar to the bones of modern apes. Oh, interesting. Uh, what are those apes? Chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and baboons. What the hell, you guys? Like, an editor didn't catch that. You didn't catch that. Neither of you caught that. It's it's lumping in baboons, a monkey, just a, a straight up monkey, in with the rest of the apes. That's that's uh, that's pretty crazy. We agree with the paleo experts who maintain that, and then we get a nice quote from Esteban Sarmiento. Australopithecus was a mainly quadrupedal animal, like the living African apes. Even when it came down to the ground, it still spent a lot of time standing and walking on all fours. So, most of these by Esteban Sarmiento are prior to the discovery of the Dikika child, one, which informed a lot of what we know about the types of bipedality that Australopithecus is engaging in. Not a lot of, but it, it kind of hammers at home. But more importantly, Esteban Sarmiento's case is not that Australopithecus was a terrestrial quadruped. The case that he's making is that it still spent some time both in the trees and on all fours. He doesn't take the idea of sort of an arboreal to bipedalism hypothesis. He's kind of of the old guard that proposes that we went through either a palmograde or a knuckle walking phase. He's not proposing that there was no bipedality. And to support this idea, I went hunting for Esteban Sarmiento material, and I found this paper titled Generalized Quadrupeds Committed Bipeds in a Shift to Open Habitats and Evolutionary Model of Hominid Divergence. 
Um, this is Esteban Sarmiento's model, right? Like how he thinks bipedalism evolved. And when you go through this, you will see that he categorizes numerous different localities of Australopithecus afarensis with different levels of bipedalism. Now, the quote itself doesn't come from a Sarmiento paper, interestingly enough. It instead comes from a summation of Sarmiento's uh, ideas, beliefs, from a text called The Human Lineage by Cartmill and Smith. So I nosed around until I could find it, and here is what it says. You should be seeing it on the screen any minute now. <laughs> As you can see, one persistent set of questions centers on the vertebral column of Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, compared to modern humans or similar size, Australopithecus had small ape-like lumbar and first sacral vertebral bodies. And then it cites a bunch of people. It would seem that the bodies of these vertebra were not as well adapted as those of Homo to carrying the weight of the upper part of the body. This perplexing fact can be given at least four different spins. And what I have circled here is spin number one, the exact quote from Contested Bones, which says Australopithecus was, was a mainly quadrupedal animal living like the African apes. Even when it came down to the ground, it still spent a lot of time standing and walking around on all fours. And then as you can see, the other three hypotheses surround being partially bipedal, as does this first one, but the other three don't involve quadrupedalism. So all three of these ideas involve being a biped at least some of the time, but I wanted to suss out why Sarmiento thought this. The authors elaborate a bit on Sarmiento's claim here on the same page where they say, in support of his claim that Australopithecus was a chimpanzee-like quadruped, Sarmiento 1998 notes that the sacral promontory, the upper front edge of the first sacral vertebral body, is more sharply angled in humans than in African apes. The more acute angle in Homo is correlatory of our sharp lumbosacral inflection. In the sacra of STS-14 and Lucy, the angle is blunt and ape-like, and so Sarmiento infers that these early hominins lacked a human-like lumbar lordosis. So then the authors of this book go on to argue that Australopithecus afarensis probably had six lumbar vertebra, and that as such, this problem that Sarmiento notes isn't a problem, uh, and that the six vertebral bodies, uh, six lumbar vertebra that is allowed for lumbar lordosis, despite what Sarmiento notes. But the 5% five uh, five degree difference between Australopithecus and the human maximum might just be another side effect of Australopithecus having six lumbar vertebra with correspondingly reduced intervertebral angles. So the question then becomes, does Australopithecus have five or six lumbar vertebra, and how does this impact its ability to have lumbar lordosis or the curve of the lower back, which is necessary for bipedality? So this is a paper titled Lumbar Lordosis of Extinct Hominins. It came out a year after that text we just read from, The Human Lineage, which came out in 2010. This is from 2011, and it has Ella Bin as an author on here. Now, Contested Bones likes to tote out Ella Bin later when they talk about Australopithecus sediba, because they can use her to make their case there, or at least they used to be able to use her to make their case. I think it's it's much more difficult now, but we'll get there when we get there. Uh, I very much doubt, though, that they would allot for her the same respect of her expertise when she disagrees with them. She, again, specializes on the vertebral column, so I think that this is going to be an excellent person to consult with regard to how many lumbar vertebra do Australopithecus have? We know Australopithecus sediba has five as the human condition, but what about Australopithecus afarensis, and how does that relate to its lumbar lordosis or lack thereof. So we're just going to read the abstract. This is free online, so you can go out there and read it for yourself if you want. Link in the description. But they start by saying the lordotic curvature of the lumbar spine, lumbar lordosis in humans, is a critical component in the ability to achieve upright posture and bipedal gait. Only general estimates of the lordotic angle, LA, of extinct hominins are currently available, most of which are based on the wedging of the vertebral bodies. Recently, a new method for calculating the LA and skeletal material has become available. This method is based on the relationship between lordotic curvature and the orientation of the inferior articular process relative to the vertebral bodies and the lumbar spines of living primates. Using this relationship, we developed a new regression model in order to calculate the LAs and hominins. These models are based on, are on primate group means and, we and were used to calculate the LAs and the spines of eight extinct hominins. The results were also compared with the LAs of modern humans and modern non-human apes. The lordotic angles of Australopiths, 41 degrees plus or minus 4, Homo erectus, and 
uh, fossil homo sapiens are similar to those of modern humans. This analysis confirms the assumption that human-like lordotic curvature was a morphologic change that took place during the acquisition of erect posture and bipedalism as the habitual form of locomotion. Neanderthals have smaller lordotic angles than modern humans, but higher angles than non-human apes. This suggests possible subtle differences in Neanderthal posture and locomotion from that of modern humans. Fascinating. So in this case, it seems that Esteban Sarmiento's case that the lordotic curvature is, is absent, is not capable of existing in Australopithecus is wrong. And to my understanding, he has not spoken on the lordosis of Australopithecus after this paper came out. It's possible that I missed something, but I did look and I searched for a lot of Sarmiento uh, material when I was, you know, trying to suss out where that quote actually came from. And it wasn't even a direct quote from him. It should be noted as well that this paper discusses the rather consensus view that all Schulpitz had five lumbar vertebra, the human condition, and lists some of the individuals who've proposed six in the past, and they're 2002 and prior. So it seems as though this is kind of an idea that is going by the wayside, especially as we pull, pull more fossils up out of the ground. But that being said, I'm not a vertebral column person, so I suppose there could be some individuals out there who are still holding to this idea. That being said, I think we can rest assured that Esteban Sarmiento's idea of a quadrupedal australopith was fringe when he proposed it and now is even less tenuous if he even still holds that idea, which we don't have any support for given, to my knowledge, he's not published on it. But moving onward, <laughs> we've, we've made it this far, and we're not even into the Australopithecus section yet, we will sometimes need to use the terminology of the splitters when we discuss the bones that are claimed to be separate species or genera. For example, we will discuss a set of bones that was originally classified as Australopithecus, but were later reclassified as Artipithecus and given the name Arti. The Artipithecus genus uh, includes bones that are extremely ape-like and are very similar to the other Australopithecines as paleo-experts have noted, to keep things simple, we will accept the original designation of Artie as an Australopithecine ape type. To keep things really simple, we're just going to go ahead and accept the original designation of Earth as a flat, stellar body. You don't just appeal to the original idea because it's easier. You have to go with the right idea. Now, Artipithecus ramidus, when it was initially designated as Australopithecus ramidus, was known from like a handful of teeth. Like that was pretty much it. There was not much to go off of for Artipithecus. This was back in the 90s, and it wouldn't be until 2009 that the big skeletal remains, the actual Arty skeleton, was published. And since then, we've pulled a lot more from the species up from the ground, and we know that this thing is dramatically different from Australopithecus. It's different in the teeth. It's different in the face. It's different in the brain case size. It's different in the pelvis. It's different in the feet. I mean, this thing is just far from a member of Australopithecus. But they're just going to call it that, I guess, so, and we're just going to have to live with that, evidently. <laughs> the second section describes Australopithecus afarensis and Australopithecus ramidus. I'm not going to call it Austral or Arty, or I'm going to call it Artipithecus ramidus, not Australopithecus ramidus from here on out. I'm not going to call it the wrong thing. Australopithecus sedibo will be described separately in section three, bones of the middle type. The transitionals. <laughs> and at last, we arrive at the actual section on Lucy. <clears throat> Australopithecus afarensis, the full story about Lucy, and Lucy is in quotation marks. She's no lady. <laughs> Everyone knows Lucy, but how much do we really know? Lucy is the nickname given to a partial skeleton discovered in 1974 in the Afar region of Ethiopia. So far, so good. Lucy is the defining species specimen of a hominin species named Australopithecus afarensis, and then they put in parentheses afarensis. You cannot do that. That's not appropriate, but I mean, you can do it, but it just makes you look like a big idiot. Over 400 specimens have been attributed, blah, 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 blah. Most of them are isolated fragments, etc., etc. <laughs> Although the Lucy skeleton is very incomplete, it is the only specimen that can be assembled with any degree of confidence. Wrong. The Kika child, Katanumu man as well, just off the top of my head, two other partial skeletons. Dakika especially is very complete. For this reason, the term Lucy and the term afarensis are too often used interchangeably. I've only ever seen that in texts like this, creationist texts. To be clear, Lucy is an incomplete single skeleton. Afarensis, also look at the afarensis, is an extinct population of presumably similar individuals. Apart from the Lucy skeleton, Australopithecus afarensis is only represented by a loose collection of isolated bones and bone fragments. 
I just put no, and then beside I put Deke and Cad for Dakika Child and Katanumu Man as well. Let's take a moment and appreciate what those are, just so we can enjoy making these guys look like dinguses. Dakika Child. The Dakika Child is a member of Australopithecus afarensis, and it's got a lot of material to it. We also have Kadanumu Man, Kadanumu Man, which has good material for it as well. And these are skeletons aside from the thousands of individual specimens that can be assigned to the species. Now, you might be briefly wondering, well, why can we assign them to the species? How, how can we do so? And it's because if you find a lot of like distal tibias that look the same, they probably belong to the same species. It's just not that complicated. But let's continue. Lucy is the most famous hominin fossil and is considered by many to be the best evidence for human evolution. <laughs> I just put who? <laughs> who considers Lucy to be the evidence of human evolution? Um, Afarensis can be about butts in all the textbooks, it's either just being mad that it's found everywhere. If you were to take a survey of people, they're going to mention Lucy. However, it is likely none of these students would have heard her full story. The nickname Lucy was coined when Donald Johansson and his team celebrated the discovery while they were listening to the Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. The skeleton is 40% complete, and then in parentheses they have actually only 20% taking into account the missing bones of the hands and feet. So we need to appreciate something again, and that's the bilaterally symmetric nature of us. We are mammals. Mammals are bilaterally symmetric. Many animals are bilaterally symmetric, except for, you know, pentaderms and things like that. But what this means is that if you find one half of the skull, you can mirror it over to the other half down the midline of the body. That's just how these things work. Let me pull out all my rectus here for a second. It's how Saul Schwartz reconstruction. So if I find this portion of the zygomatic on this individual's left side, I can pretty safely bet that the other side is going to look the same, given we reflect mirrored down the midline of the body, bilateral, both sides symmetrically, right? This is not that difficult of a concept to understand. And when we do that, uh, the skeleton is even more complete than 40%. Continuing onward, textbooks claim, although that Lucy and her kind lived millions of years before modern humans, that Australopithecus afarensis walked in a fully upright manner, just like us. Textbooks and museum displays routinely show an artistic rendition of Lucy having an ape's head, but an anatomically modern human body with a modern spine, rib cage, hips, legs, hands, and feet. No, but we'll get there. And then they show this picture of the Hadar individuals, Hadar individual specimens. And then they show Lucy over here and an artistic reconstruction. At one point in here, they say, with the exception of the right talus and two phalanges, all the bones of the hands and feet are absent. Lucy is promoted as an upright walking ancestor with anatomically modern human hands and feet. False. We do not think that her hands and feet were anatomically modern. We think they were more similar to humans than they are to the Miocene apes that preceded this species. This is really basic stuff, and, and this is the kind of thing that really pisses me off about this book, is that it feels like Rupe, perhaps, never took a biological anthropology class or anything with regard to paleontology to know what we actually say about this specimen. It worries me because it makes me feel like he didn't read any of the literature. We'll see if that comes to fruition. The Lucy skeleton, AL2881, reveals the limb proportions and overall body size of an ordinary chimpanzee wrong. That's patently incorrect. Now, remember, this thing was first published in 2017. So what does the literature say about the body proportions of Australopithecus afarensis? Would you look at this? A paper from 2004 looking at the body proportions of Homo habilis. You might be thinking, why are we worried about habilis? We're talking about Australopithecus afarensis. And that's because Australopithecus afarensis was also investigated here. They're basically trying to figure out how Homo habilis compares to Australopithecus afarensis, um, which has been proposed in the past to be more modern with regard to body proportions than even the later Homo habilis. So they know here the present analysis shows that the upper to lower limb proportions of both OH62, so that's your Homo habilis, and AL2881, Australopithecus afarensis, fall in the modern human range of variation, although OH62 also falls into that of chimpanzees to the due to the overlap in small individuals. Um, this one's Homo habilis, so Australopithecus afarensis falls into 
the human range. Wow, we can't get that right, can we? Guys, this is not hard. I, I sat down and I Googled body proportions of hominids, and this was like the third thing that came up. Interestingly enough, there are like numerous papers that look at this, and Australopithecus afarensis consistently falls out into the human range. And this is really interesting, right, that this happens so early in human evolution. She's got short legs, like a chimp, and short arms, like a human does. So she's actually falls more similar to humans when we look at the actual numbers, which is fascinating to think about. You can check this out for yourself in the, uh, in the comments section. So I'm going to go ahead and classify that as the first just blatantly untrue thing that could have been fixed by even the lightest of literature searches. And we're going to keep a running tab of that, or we're going to try. Lucy was about three and a half feet high and had a skull that was the size and general shape of a chimpanzee's. It had the long arms and shortened legs of an ape. No, as we just talked about, she had shorter arms. She had short legs as well, but her arms were not long like a chimpanzee's. That's one of the more derived aspects of her. Her skull is more chimpanzee-like than it is human-like, but the brain case size is generally higher than a chimp's. The face is less prognathic. The canines are smaller. You can see this, you can see this for yourself. This is an Australopithecus afarensis composite, and this is a chimpanzee ceramic cast. And the two of these animals, while more similar to each other than perhaps either is to a human in the skull, are still markedly different. Um, this is obviously more different than a chimp would be to a bonobo. And yes, of course, they are separate species. Those two species are also massively different in the minutia of their dentition. So the, the way that their molars function, chimpanzees have molars of like a more frugivorous, soft food eater. Australopithecus tends to have uh, teeth that are built for more robust eating, eating tougher, harder foodstuffs. Um, Australopithecus tends to be the generalist among the Australopithecus, or excuse me, Australopithecus afarensis tends to be the generalist among the Australopithecus members, but anyways, Lucy's skeleton has no hands. The legs are incomplete and the feet are essentially absent. They're not absent though. Like there, there's not much to them, but they're not absent. And as we will see momentarily, we have feet from Australopithecus afarensis that aren't associated with Lucy. Moreover, Lucy's incomplete anatomy is not readily validated by other afarensis remains because isolated bones and bone fragments cannot unambiguously be classified as being the same species. They can if they are of diagnostically informative sites, right? Teeth are easily attributable to Australopithecus afarensis. And the same is true for aspects of the long bones, which is how we know that, we'll get to it in a second, but Lucy's knee and femur belong to that species, Australopithecus afarensis. They don't look like anything else that was living on the landscape at the time. They fall within the range of what we know is Australopithecus afarensis. This, this would be like saying if you found a human, like a piece of a human femur in, in like the Congo, you couldn't tell that it was from a human. Yes, we can, because we know what human femurs look like. And the same is true for, for most of the animals in the fossil record whose record is more scant than Australopithecus afarensis. But these guys will pick and choose. As we will see, it is quite clear that many of the isolated bones attributed to afarensis are in fact not of the same species. Really, will we see that? Well, I guess we'll find out. As Johansson himself writes in a 1979 science paper that describes his findings, a number of skeletal elements found at Hadar, particularly some of the hands and foot bones, are either absent or poorly represented at other sites, which makes meaningful comparisons impossible. Oh, really? Jo Johansson said that in 1979? I wonder how we, like, how we fare now. Where do we stand now? Decades and decades and decades later. However, where, wherever meaningful comparisons between Lucy and other afarensis specimens have been possible, they've confirmed Lucy's apish anatomy. This is false. This is, we're going to add this to another blatantly false. That's two. That's two so far. Such comparisons have further revealed the extreme level of anatomical variation in the Hadar collection of bones. This sparked considerable debate within the paleo community. Did afarensis bones represent a single species or perhaps two or more species? That is actually true. We're not sure, for instance, if Australopithecus diaromita or Australopithecus barogazali belong to Australopithecus afarensis or not. But we do know that Australopithecus afarensis was probably really dimorphic. That's, we'll get to that later. But I also put, with regard to the apish anatomy, I put foot because she they put Lucy's baby right here. That's in reference to the Dikika child, whose foot is pretty dang derived, especially compared to Miocene apes that came before. But 
even on its own, it looks it, it falls closer to the human end than it does to your Miocene ape end. Although many of the afarensis bones are described as very ape-like, there are bones that appear to be distinctly different species that in fact belong in a different genus. These out-of-place bones were acknowledged to be present from, from the onset by Johansson and his co-workers in the field. And he goes on, they go on and on and on. This is the most shocking part of Lucy Discovery explained further. This explains why some of the bones of the afarensis type have been described as remarkably human, while others have been described as strikingly similar to those of a chimpanzee. I put, here's your transitional on the side, right? Like, if something, this is the ape man, right? That ape woman that they've been asking for, for since the dawn of time, since the dawn of creationism, they've been asking for a perfect ape man. And whenever they get it, nope, that can't be it. It's too transitional. It's actually just a mix of human and australopith bones. And okay, well, you know, nothing, nothing will ever be good, good enough. Those goalposts are on wheels and like attached to a, a rocket, like a rocket powered engine to jettison it into the sun. Nevertheless, because the human bones in the afarensis mix were relatively rare, the overall anatomical picture of afarensis, including Lucy Skelton, is unmistakably ape. If Lucy's bones are clearly apish, on what basis was Lucy assigned human hands, human feet, human knees, human hips, human spine, and human posture? The answer is found in the human-looking footprints discovered soon after Lucy's find was published. Now, again, I put Dikika over here on the side because all of these aspects are not all of them corroborated specifically by Tikika child, but certainly many of them are corroborated as being anatomically modern by, not anatomically modern, anatomically more modern than predecessors like Ardipithecus ramnus by the Tikika child and other finds. So, I, I mean, we're going to get to this. We're going to get to this. Now we're going to talk about the Laetoli footprints. They start off this section by saying, Lucy's feet are missing, but some claim that she left human-like footprints. The some there, that's just... That's just the paleoanthropological community. These days, I don't know of anybody who proposes that the G trackway at Laetoli was not made by Australopithecus afarensis. Um, there's another trackway there, the A trackway, but this trackway is probably not Australopithecus afarensis. We know this based off of the biomechanics, and we'll get to that. Um, then they go into like a pretty decent summary here of like what actually happened, where the tracks are found, how old they are. The Laetoli footprints are found in Laetoli, which is in Tanzania. As they note here, they were found in 1976 by Leakeys, and they look pretty human. They look human-like. That's what do we mean when we say human-like? Well, an inline big toe looks like it has three arches in the feet, things like that. And we didn't know of anything at the time that these were found with any certainty that had that kind of foot morphology. We'll get there though. Um, 3.7 million years old, talk about how long they are, who they were, three individuals traveling in, an, in sort of an ash fall that had happened due to a volcanic eruption nearby, covered the landscape in ash, and then three australopiths are walking along, leaving their tracks. Uh, the Laetoli footprints were found more than 1,000 miles away from where the fossil remains of Lucy's kind were found, and they were dated to nearly half a million years older than Lucy, yet Johansson strongly asserted these footprints must have been made by his species. They're just imposing malice on these guys as if it's some kind of sneaky cabal of individuals who are trying to push evolution despite evidence to the contrary. I know that this is exactly what they think, right? Um, and they're just willing to, to pack this chapter full of mistruths in order to make it seem that way, which really pisses me off, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll continue on. I've got a lot to say and, and I wanna get through all of it. In this section here where they show the Laetuli footprints and they give a little description of them, they say that a number of anatomists who examined the footprints have noted that they look identical to those of modern humans. There's no source here, and there's no source for a reason. No anatomist looked at the Elitoli footprints and said, these are identical to modern humans. Uh, that did not happen. Mary Leakey, when she first stumbled across them, said that they looked remarkably human, but no one proposed that these were anatomically modern human. No mistake about it certainly not anatomists. And I suspect that if they had a quote that supported that, they would have cited it. So they continue onward. They use the word palo expert again, which that's why I have the T here to combat the, uh, the acid flooding my gastrointestinal system. What made Johansson's claim so audacious? Because Johansson, of course, claimed that it came from Australopithecus afarensis. The reason is because it matched the morphology, or, or at least our understanding of the morphology of Australopithecus afarensis at the time, and no other hominin came anywhere close to matching it, because these things didn't look like modern human footprints. They looked like something very similar, remarkably human, but not certainly human, right? So while it was pretty bold of Johansson to, to make that claim, because he kind of made it outright, 
no one really came out and was like, oh my god, you moron, that's ridiculous to say. Species have long tenures and they live in wide areas. Look at the range of chimpanzees today. They cover a broad, broad area of Central Africa. I mean, they can be found in the Congo, in Tanzania, in Kenya. It's just not surprising that an Australopith would have a similarly broad range, especially when there aren't humans to kind of curb how they can expand. So the, the, the distance away and the time is not really an issue. What made Johansson's claim so audacious was not just the fact that they totally footprints were the wrong age and in the wrong place, but they were unmistakably human. That's underlined. I just wrote wrong again at the top because they are not. <laughs> Nevertheless, I got, and look at this, unmistakably human, indistinguishable from modern humans. That's just false. That's just not true. Nevertheless, John Johansson's extraordinary claim linking Lucy to footprints eventually came, became academic dogma and popular wisdom. Outside the field of paleoanthropology has become a widely accepted simple fact that Lucy and the Atoli footprints are a part of the same story. Since the feet were missing from Lucy's skeleton, Johansson could assert that Lucy had feet virtually identical to her own, to our own. If Lucy had human-looking feet, it was only reasonable to assume that Lucy walked erect and had human legs, hips, and a spine. This line of reasoning has driven the thinking of much of the paleo community ever since. This makes me really mad. So we're gonna get to the pelvis later, as well as the femur, specifics of the knees, uh, furry and magnum position, things like that. But first I wanna talk a little bit about the feet because I don't have a model for the feet. And this is kind of as good a time as any to point out the BS in contested bones. So this is a paper titled The Paleoanthropology of Hadar, Ethiopia, and it's by uh, Johansson. This is, again, you can find this for free online. It's not behind a paywall or anything. And this seeks to just look, and so that's your spoiler about Lucy's knee, this seeks to just kind of characterize what the chronology, what the paleo environment, and what the finds were at Hadar. So they basically discuss the hundreds of finds at this location, and then they go, and there's a nice picture of some of them. Those in the back, these are chimpanzee skulls, but these are the finds from the initial Hadar expedition. Hadar expedition, I never know how to say it. Uh, all the fossil hominins recovered from the Hadar formation are presenting over 400,000 years of time were assigned to Australopithecus afarensis. So they assigned all of the individuals that were hominin to Australopithecus. Then they note down here, most importantly, it embodied a plethora of anatomical features found in abundance at the Hadar sample, indicating that the hominins found at the two sites of the same species. So this is that thing I'm talking about, diagnostic characteristics. This is how you know if you find a mandible at Latoli and you find a mandible at Hadar, and they both have certain characteristics of Australopithecus afarensis, that they belong to the same species. The Hadar and Latoli specimens were placed in the genus Australopithecus, not Homo, largely because they lack facial reduction and cranial enlargement. So moving down here, we see some of the femurs. Uh, this is what I want to talk about, this section here. Extensive arguments center around the nature of bipedalism in Australopithecus afarensis. The rich collection of postcranial material, including a pelvis and nearly complete foot and numerous lower limb bones, provided solid evidence that Australopithecus afarensis was a fully bipedal creature. In contrast, others suggested that these creatures were highly arboreal and perhaps males and females walked differently. They further suggested that during terrestrial bipedal locomotion, Australopithecus afarensis was not capable of full extension of the hip and knee. However, a detailed study of biomechanics of these postcranial bones does not support this observation. So in addition to this, we also have, I believe, isolated metatarsals and phalanges and all sorts of things like that that lead us to have a very good idea of what the feet of these things look like. Do we have the foot for Lucy the specimen? No. Do we have Australopithecus feet from the same site, feet and toes and ankle bones? Yes, as well as lower limb bones. So this is one of the more famous fossils. It's a partial foot, of course, from Hadar. It's AL333-115, a partial Australopithecus afarensis foot. You see all five toes are represented, one, two, three, four, five. And we have the phalanges here, along with the distal portions of metatarsals. And from these, we can learn a lot about the arches of whether or not Australopithecus afarensis one had arches and two, whether or not it had a toe in line with the rest of the feet. We know from these and others that yes, they have the arches similar to humans, the triple arches, perhaps not to the same degree, but all three arches are present, zero in chimpanzee, by the way, uh, as well as the fact that they had a powerful inline helix for towing off. Now, in addition to this, we have this paper from, let's see, 2012, New Postcranial Fossils from Australopithecus afarensis, 1990 to 2007. Now, I like this paper because I know one of the authors, I know Carol Ward, she's cool. 
Um, and what they know here is that we've got a lot of new stuff. Several specimens provide important new data about this species, including new vertebra, supporting the hypothesis that Australopithecus afarensis may have had a more human-like thoracic form than previously expected or appreciated with an invaginated thoracic vertebral column. Boy, we were just talking about the human-like vertebral column of Australopithecus afarensis. A distal pollicle phalanx confirms the presence of a human-like flexor pollicis longus muscle in Australopithecus afarensis. The new fossils include the first complete fourth metatarsal known for Australopithecus afarensis. This specimen exhibits the dorsoplantarly expanded base, axial torsion, and domed head typical of humans, revealing the presence of a human-like permanent longitudinal and transverse arches in the extension of the metatarsophalangeal joints, as in human-like heel off during gait. The new Hadar postcranial fossils provide a more complete picture of the postcranial functional anatomy, individual and temporal variation within the sample, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we have the comparison of the, uh, the partial foot, that uh, 333, 115, to the Dakika child, which we also have a partial foot for. And boy, wouldn't you know it, when you look at them side by side, this, of course, the Dakika child belongs to a kid and the foot, the partial foot belongs to an adult. But boy, wouldn't you know it, that looks like a bipedal foot to me. So this is not like completely in the dark, right? In fact, we know quite a bit about it. Now you might be seeing this in this picture up here and saying, wait a second, that looks like a divergent halux. This is not Australopithecus afarensis. This is the Bertil foot, which is not assigned to Australopithecus afarensis. And it's probably, in my opinion, a late surviving relative of Ardipithecus. Ramidus. The morphology of the individual bones of the Bertil foot are also starkly different from what we see in Australopithecus afarensis. So before the creationists start saying, well, the Bertil foot is belongs to Australopithecus afarensis and the Australopithecus afarensis feet are just little itty bitty teeny tiny humans. No, that's not going to work. I want to hammer home again, though, just how many fossil specimens we have of different Australopith um, foot pieces in general, but as well as specifically Australopithecus afarensis. This is from an article titled The Evolution of the Human Foot, link in the comments. And in figure one, you can see that it says the only early hominid fossil foot was OH8 when Sussman originally wrote his article. A composite of the Hadar foot is shown here to represent the large collection of material for Australopithecus afarensis. And there's your little picture. Uh, you can't appreciate it a ton, but there it is. <laughs> Inline toe and all. And you should notice that Pretty much everything after the Hadar material has an inline halix and is remarkably derived. But we also have a nice chart in here that I appreciate that shows the elements preserved for each of our hominins for the feet. And Australopithecus afarensis in particular is well represented. Um, the other Australopithecines are too. Australopithecus sediva has some nice material and I don't think Africanus is included in here, but obviously the little foot specimen STW573 is well represented as well. The point being characterizing Lucy as having no feet um, is kind of a bait and switch, right? It's a, the character, the individual Lucy doesn't have the characters associated with the foot morphology, but the dozens of other individual specimens from the site allow us to know with certainty what the Australopithecus foot at least generally looked like. I appreciate saying with certainty and then generally is kind of silly, but you know, we know that it didn't have a divergent halix, for instance, and we know that it had three arches in the feet. So I will stick this in description. Um, it is the evolution of human foot McNutt et al. from 2018. So it's a nice and recent article as well. Let's move on to the Laetoli footprints. So here's a picture of a Laetoli footprint. And at first glance, I, as well as you, would look at this and say, wow, like as these guys in contested bones are about to know, if you saw this on the beach, you wouldn't do a double take. You wouldn't think that there was some crazed big foot running around. You would just say, that's kind of a weird footprint. But how do humans leave footprints in the sand? Here is an example of one of the oldest human footprints in North America. And you can see all five digits. The halix is longer than the rest of the toes. That great toe is longer. And we have a, a very strong arch here that leads to a uh, sort of divot in the side of the footprint. That is not present in this foot, but I can do you one better because we took casts of this thing and we compared the biomechanics of the Laetuli footprints to the biomechanics of modern human hunter-gatherers walking barefoot in an ash-like substrate, as well as an upright chimpanzee doing the same thing. And we'll be referencing that biomechanics study here in a minute, but 
I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the feet and the sample at Hadar so that you are aware that we don't just have Lucy and we do have phalanges and metatarsals that are clearly not human. They're too small to be, they're too misshapen to be. And yet we do know that they belong to a biped because they couldn't not have. They were biomechanically um, indicative of something that walks on two feet and transfers its way. But despite the number of specimens that we can attribute to the feet of Australopithecus afarensis, just at Hadar, not even including all of the other localities and all of the other feet associations with Australopithecus, the genus, these guys are still going to say that we got nothing and it's all make-believe. And they have to because they need to explain away the association of the Latoli footprints, which are again clearly bipedal, with Australopithecus afarensis. So let's continue. They show this picture, which is just abhorrent. Um, it doesn't make any sense because what they're basically saying is, see, this of which of these could this be? It, it could only be a human. And then they show a chimpanzee foot, a gorilla foot, an orangutan, a human, a siamang, and a baboon. Okay, which is the only one of these that is a terrestrial biped? Humans and siamangs when they come to the ground. But humans are the only ones that move primarily terrestrially bipedally. So of course, it's a one-to-one, -one, right? But I put on the side, this is compared to the X dance right? Duh, Australopithecus afarensis of all of these individuals, if you stuck it on here, would be the closest to us. So you would, be, you would expect it to have the closest foot morphology to us as well. And as I showed, it does. So this is just in, in, intensely deceptive, in my opinion. Um, and then I put two, underlined anatomically human. Still no citation for that anatomically modern, anatomically human, definitely human. They're just asserting it. So they continue to say it's very clear that the fossilized footprints from like totally lack a divergent helix. Yes, I agree. Finally, we agree on something. They are totally discordant with the feet of any ape, of any living non-human ape, I would agree. They are indistinguishable from modern human footprints, both in size and shape. No, they are not, right? They're not in size and shape, but we will talk about the biomechanics paper once we can kind of put a bow on their conversation with like totally footprints. So they quote Owen Lovejoy and they quote Bruce Latimer and Mary Leakey, all three basically saying, yeah, they, they look pretty human. Bruce Latimer says, and I want you to pay attention to how they're phrasing this. First, Owen Lovejoy says that they are, that when we're comparing the prints to a chimpanzee, the difference is immediately obvious. Yeah, of course they are because the Latoli footprint makers were not quadrupedal. Then Bruce Latimer says, when I saw the footprints being excavated, I thought, gosh, you'd lose these on a modern day beach. They have an arch and, are, and a totally human gait. Yes, true. This does not mean they belong to a modern human because Australopithecus afarensis has those traits as well. And then Mary Leakey says, make no mistake about it. They are like modern human footprints. If one were left, if one were left in the sand of California Beach today, etc., etc., the classic, if you saw it on the beach, it would look human-like. There's a well-shaped modern heel with a strong arch and a good ball on the front foot of it. The toe is straight in line. It doesn't stick out to the side like an ape toe or like a big toe in so many drawings you see of Australopithecus scenes in the books. Yes. This is from, this is the see, citation 19, this was from 1981. So at that time, yes, we did not have published material very many feet. Morphologist and former research expert on Laetoli footprints, Russell Tuttle, affirms Tim White's evaluation, writing, indiscernible features of Laetoli G prints are indistinguishable from those of habitually barefoot Homo sapiens. And then I put biomechanics paper plus size. So we're going to talk about those in a second. And discernible features as well. So discernible features is just eyeballing it. When you eyeball this thing, as you saw, as you can see here, right, it does look indistinguishable from a modern human footprint. It has an inline halix, it has three arches, it has a heel, right? But this does not mean it's anatomically modern because you have to run a biomechanics analysis to actually figure that out. And that is where they fall intermediately, how they carried that weight. The morphology looks modern, which, is why it drives me crazy that they get so pissed off when we portray Lucy like this with the, the inline halix. Of course, they, they don't associate those because they just don't know about the feet, evidently. That's why they call this the Lucy chapter and not just an Australopithecus afarensis chapter. Okay, so they finish uh, quote mining and then they say, leading paleo experts, including those who are directly involved with studying Latoli footprints, agree they look indistinguishable from modern humans. Why then weren't the fossilized footprints attributed to Homo sapiens or Erectus? The answer has to do with the presumed age of those footprints and deeply entrenched evolutionary preconceptions. So it is true that looking at these footprints due to the size and shape, when people initially saw them, they were like, wow, those do look remarkably human. But then they, of course, noted that they were very ancient and thus could not be modern Homo sapiens from a conventionally scientific standpoint. 
However, as the years went by, we did more in-depth studies with the Laetuli footprints and figured out that while they do, to an untrained eye, look indistinguishable from modern humans, they are different. They are intermediate to us and something that is sort of a knuckle walker or an arboreal uh, pronograde, palm grade quadruped. According to the ape man story, okay, they get mad about how we didn't assign them to homo sapiens. They complain about the artistic reconstruction. This is a typical artistic reconstruction of the famous Lucy skeleton. The head is ape yet from the neck down, Lucy is shown to be remarkably human. Lucy looks fully human except for the head, made so that she appears deep in thought, perhaps working out a calculus problem. They're so mad about these artistic reconstructions. But like, if you're that mad, put in the effort to debunk it. Don't put out contested bones, right? We evidently don't even know about the, the fossil feet of this thing. When artistic reconstructions tell one story, the fossil evidence tells another. Oh, it also says here, the artistic reconstructions are based on fragmentary fossil remains and the artistic imagination is used to fill in the portion of the skeleton that are missing to portray the skin, hair, face, whites around the eyes, posture, and general character of the creature. Lucy is deliberately made to appear transitional between ape and man. I just put no... Right, because again, we have so much to Australopithecus afarensis, so many fossils that are attributable to the species. We know what it looked like skeletally. Now, it does get dicey when we're picking the color of the fur, right, or how much fur to put on. There's some molecular clock studies can, that can add to that. But the general shape of the thing is very solid, right? The whites of the eyes thing pisses me off every time because all extant apes can have whites in their eyes. So that's not really a huge stretch. Foot and hand bones show afarensis did not walk upright like humans. Ooh, okay, so we are going to talk about the fossil feet. I'm excited. While artistic reconstructions tell one story, the fossil evidence tells another. The actual skeletal remains of Lucy reveal that many of the critical bones are missing, okay? Since the discovery of Lucy, 400 additional bones and bone fragments of the Lucy type have been found in the Hara region. Of approximately, or approximately 37 of those are foot bones, and they cite 27. That's uh, just a... Uh, Pliocene hominids from the Hadar Formation Ethiopia paper, stratigraphic chronologic and paleoenvironmental context. Nearly 50 we include those recovered since Johansson's early expeditions. These bones provide direct evidence about the nature of Lucy's missing feet. They indicate Lucy's kind had ape-like feet. Okay, you you have my you had my curiosity. Now you have my attention. Now let's let's hear. Maybe it's the other way around. It's been a long since uh, time since I've seen Django. The most complete afarensis foot specimen is the partial left foot from Hadar designated AL333115. Okay, so we are talking about it. Like the other foot bones from Hadar, it was found in isolation. Assuming the foot belongs to Lucy's kind, what does its anatomy reveal? Okay, we know that it did because we have other, like, foot remains to compare it to. And, like, they all look the same. All of the metatarsals and phalanges look like the same morphology. So we know that there was one hominin that had this morphology and there's only one hominin at this time known to be in Hadar, and it's Lucy. It's Australopithecus afarensis. Okay, Johansson and those with him who promote Lucy as a habitual biped claim the partial foot is human-like. I just put yes, <laughs> they do. <laughs> You're telling me people with, with actual formal training in anatomy think that it looks human-like? Shocking. Well, I wonder why we didn't include this in the previous section. So how are they going to write this off? Now that they've admitted that, of course, the paleo experts agree with me because I of course agree with the consensus what are we going to say how are we going to how are we going to hand wave this way as as it is necessary to support the claim afarensis formulated to the footprints it's interesting to know however that Johansson's team said to frame their reconstruction of the afarensis foot based off of a human foot template specimen OH8 recovered from Moldavai Gorge in Tanzania that foot bone was originally attributed to a mohabos but was later reassigned to a erectus. Not surprisingly, the end result was a very human looking reconstruction. It is this human biased reconstruction of Lucy's feet that is widely promoted in education systems and shown in museum displays. Okay, so they literally just said, nope, they're wrong. And we think they're wrong because they're biased. Guys, what? I can't, why, why not just ignore it? If you're going to talk, if you're going to give this bad of an explanation for a hand wave, then why not just ignore it? Okay, also I thought I was going crazy, but I saw OH8 and I was like, I could swear that's homo habilis because we have a model of this in the lab. And I was like, I could swear it's homo habilis. I was like, I've been teaching this as homo habilis for like a year now. Oh my God, what if it's not? 
But of course it is. It's it's Homo habilis. I can't find anything about this thing being reattributed to Erectus, at least not on the not on a surface level search. Um, and clearly we're still teaching it that. Clearly this is the consensus. So I don't know why they're suggesting it was reassigned to Homo erectus. I'm sure that's going to come in later in their Homo erectus chapter so they can write this animal off. But let's let's resize myself and, and move onward. Okay, it is unfortunate that the general public has not been made aware that a large portion of the paleo community holds a competing view about losing her kind's foot anatomy and locomotor behavior. So they talk about Sussman and Cern, who talk about Lucy being a predominantly tree-dwelling australopinate that did not habitually walk upright absolutely 100% wrong. Stern and Sussman in their kind of seminal work, which these guys were the main guys going up against Lovejoy and White and all these other dudes, Johansson, the, the two camps. They did think that Lucy was absolutely bipedal when it came on the ground. They just think that it spent more time in the trees and they based this off of the curved phalanges and the more dorsally oriented shoulder blade scapulae. But to say that they didn't think that by, by proposing that Lucy was predominantly a tree dwelling nostril pit scene that did not habitually walk upright, that is absolutely incorrect. These scientists reject the human-like interpretation of the afarensis foot and take issue with the reconstruction that it was modeled based off of a human foot. So they cite this on 26. This is from Cardinal Slip. It's, it's also just from that the human lineage book. Um, this is fine. They can take issue with it, but no one doubts the reconstruction today. So that's kind of interesting, probably because we found more <laughs> metatarsals and phalanges. When the partial foot attributed to afarensis is reconstructed on its own merits based on the anatomy seen in the bones without preconceptions, researchers come to a very different conclusion. Oh good, I hope we're gonna go over Stern and Sussman 1983 because that's gonna be all they've got in the barrel of this gun. In the Journal of Physical Anthropology, <laughs> evolutionary anatomist Jack Stern and Russell Sussman performed a comprehensive analysis on a number of handed foot bones attributed to afarensis from Hadar, including the partial foot. So they go through it and then they say they describe the distinct traits. They mainly talk about the curved phalanges and their relation to having a strong hand for grasping. The general argument here is that Lovejoy and colleagues argue that Lucy was like a committed terrestrial biped who pretty much stayed on the ground and maintained these curved phalanges and powerful hands as well as the more dorsally oriented scapular shoulder blade, basically just due to phylogenetic inertia, the pressure to get rid of it isn't very strong because having curved fingers doesn't really impact your ability to walk bipedally very much. So he argues that it's a retention, whereas Stern and Sussman argue that it's a plastic trait and that actively climbing means that your bones tend to remodel themselves. And this is a tentative conclusion to make, but they argue that kind of like how bone remodeling happens with tennis players, they get bone remodeling in their dominant arm. Something similar was going on with Australopithecus afarensis and that it was probably actively engaging in arboreal behaviors, hence why it has the curved phalanges. So they're arguing for the case that the phalanges mean that it was still engaging in arboreal behaviors, not that it was an arboreal animal. They fully accept that it was bipedal when on the ground. You can see that for yourself in the 1983 paper. Okay, these uh, they state the proximal phalanges of AL333-115 are an overall morphologic pattern like those of African apes. Sussman and Stern's final conclusion was that Afarensis could not have been a strong walker. Corroborating evidence revealed additional non-human features of the feet, including divergent halices used for limb grasping typical of a tree-dwelling ape. Sussman confirms the presence of an opposable halux in Afarensis and has been confirmed by at least two other studies. So their citations here are, yep, still the 83 paper, which I happen to have in my possession. So I would like to read you a little excerpt for when I just control F halix, because I thought that this was very informative. They say, furthermore, the highly circumferential trochlear of the proximal phalanges, together with the marked longitudinal curvatures of these bones, suggest a range of plantar flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint greater than that seen in humans. The rounded basal articular surface of metatarsal 1 and the markedly convex distal surface of the medial cuneiform indicate that Australopithecus afarensis retained some ability to abduct the halix. That means that it had some ability to pull the toe away from being in line with the rest of the toes. That is a stark difference from what these guys just said here, that it maintained divergent 
Halices. In an annual review published in 2012, paleo expert Craig Stanford affirms these earlier evaluations by Stern and Sussman published in 1983, acknowledging that their assessment of Australopithecus afarensis as an arboreal adaptive species is still valid and represents the consensus view held by paleoanthropologists today. Okay, pause. This is another bait and switch and is incredibly dishonest. I'm going to add it to number three. I'm going to make this number three. And in fact, it's probably like number six now. I'm just going to stop keeping track because I kind of forgot to keep track. Anyways, the consensus view of paleoanthropologists today, and I know because I just took common in evolution last semester, so I'm on the cutting edge of what the paleoanthropological community thinks, and I attended the ABAs where some of these topics of Australopithecus afarensis locomotion were discussed, is that Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, was a species that was a terrestrial biped when it came down from the trees. So it stood up and walked around on two legs pretty efficiently, especially given the lateral flare of the ilia but that it maintains some arboreal behaviors. The consensus doesn't seem to be that it was as arboreal as Stern and Sussman proposed, but that it still engaged in arboreal behaviors, whether it was for foraging or making nests. But the overwhelming consensus is that it is morphologically bipedally adapted when it's on the ground as well. So it's maintaining previous arboreal morphologies, the curved fingers, the dorsal scapulae for the, the glenoid uh, cavity being oriented dorsally. But the overwhelming morphology also supports this bipedal movement locomotion style when on the ground. That's just what the consensus is. And I think I'm pretty qualified to say that at this point. The idea that these guys are pushing, that Lucy or Australopithecus afarensis was just an arboreal animal, they're, they're sneaking that into the consensus view that some paleoanthropologists today think it still had arboreal behaviors. Right? There's still low in love to a crowd that thinks this thing was like a committed biped. I tend to hold the belief that it still did do some arboreal things, but it's not fair of them to say the consensus is that it did some arboreal things and take that to say, see, we told you it was fully arboreal. Those aren't the same thing. They go on to say additional findings confirm Australopithecus afarensis moved and looked like a tree dwelling ape. At a lecture given at the meeting of the American Association of Physical Anthropologists in 2005, William Harcourt Smith of the American Museum of Natural History and Charles Hilton of Western Michigan University explained that Lucy's kind lacked a human arch and were flat-footed like modern apes. Okay, so they gave this talk at the AABAs. I went there this past year. Um, they used to call the AAPAs. Uh, they've changed the physical to biological because now there's such a heavy incorporation of genetics. Presenting there does not mean that your work is going to pass peer review. You tend to present at these conferences before your work finishes going through peer review as basically a, hey, here's what I'm working on. And given they immediately afterwards say, <laughs> in summarizing their research, scientific American author reports, also look at these afferences, almost certainly did not walk like us or by extension like the hominids at Lee And it's still a scientific American article. So we don't have a peer reviewed paper to support this cited in this text. That's not good, right? <laughs> you, uh, it, just, it just shows that they're not even attending conferences in their own field if they don't know that presenting at a conference is not equivalent to peer review. The overwhelming consensus is that Australopithecus afarensis has three arches and an inline big toe and made the late footprints. You also notice that this doesn't contest the inline helix, it's just contesting the arches. All right. Then they talk about uh, an article in 2011 in Science that talks about this metatarsal, this fourth metatarsal bone. And these preceding paragraphs proceed to just lose their mind about how this metatarsal, its curvature or lack thereof supporting the, um, the arches in the foot, in the, in the midfoot. They think that that is ridiculous because it's a single bone. So they've gone a full 180 here from you don't have any bones to support it to wait, not those kinds of bones. And then they also seem to think that this is the only metatarsal that we have from the specimen. Um, it's the only fully complete one that at that location, I believe, at that locality, but it is not like the only metatarsal material that we have. But I digress. They freak out about that for a little bit. And then they cite somebody who tries to challenge the paper. And the way that they do this is pretty nefarious in my opinion. P.J. Mitchell et al. published a follow-up study a year later and challenged the validity of the earlier paper. Here's what they concluded in a more thorough study published in the Journal of Comparative Human Biology. Overall, AL3-160 is most similar to the fourth metatarsal of eastern gorillas, a slow-moving quadruped that sacrifices our behaviors for terrestrial ones. 
This study highlights evolutionary misconceptions underlying the practice of using a localized anatomy and or single bony element to reconstruct overall locomotor behaviors and of summarizing great ape structure and behavior based off of non-statistically represented sa sa uh, samples of only a few living great ape species. Then they say, in summary, these researchers criticized the previous study as being bad science. The earlier research was based off of an incomplete comparison, which failed to include three out of the five great ape species. If they'd done a more complete analysis, they would have observed the strong similarity of the fourth metatarsal to that of the eastern gorilla. So it turned out a small bone may not be diagnostic of upright locomotion at all. So then they continue on and say, perhaps the most troubling is the media sensationalization. The public was left with the misleading impression that there is no longer any doubt that afferensis walked upright like a modern human. So let's talk briefly about this. So Ward et al. report on this fourth metatarsal and they assess its morphology and say that it seems to be pretty indicative of a biped, primarily because it implies arches in the feet. Then you have <clears throat> PJ, let's see, Mitchell, Mitchell et al., ah, Sarmiento is back, and Jeff Meldrum, who argue that no, in isolation, you can't do that because the comparisons of the fourth metatarsal to other great apes, and indeed some aspects of catarines, showed that it doesn't alone indicate bipedality. And I think that that's kind of fair, honestly. I've not read these two papers in their entirety, so I don't know like how robust either is. But I tend to think that, honestly, Mitchell does have a point as far as the entire suite of the characteristics being better. However, if the fourth metatarsal belongs to Australopithecus afarensis, and we have every reason to believe that it does in fact belong to that species, given we have the proximal and distal ends of other metatarsals, then what that would mean is that it is in accordance with the other bipedal characteristics the hominin has. So it's further support. It's basically a fulfilled prediction, if you will. If you have an animal with a bowl-shaped pelvis with sagittally oriented iliac blades, an anterior foramen magnum that's angled forward, a valgus knee, and an inline halix, then the prediction would be that it would also have arches in the feet. So this fulfills that expectation. In isolation, if you just found that metatarsal, I don't think you could say, wow, it belongs to a biped. Even though it is in accordance with bipedal um, locomotion, it's also, as Mitchell et al. present here, in accordance with other types of locomotion. So that's my two cents there. It's, it's kind of dumb that the authors of Contested Bones think that it should be assessed in isolation away from the rest of the bones, especially if they just got done complaining that there's not enough bones even though there are. Just as there are bones which show that Afarensis had ape-like feet, there are bones which show that it had ape-like hands. <laughs> In the American Journal of Physical Anthropology, Stern and Sussman described the Australopithecus Afarensis hand bones from Hadar. And then again, it's that 1983 paper. And primarily, as I've mentioned earlier in this video, the support for the partial arboreality of Australopithecus Afarensis, or at least habitual, or habitual arboreality, uh, comes from the curved phalanges, right? So yeah, they note here proximal phalanges indicate adaptation for suspensory and climbing activity. And then they talk about the distal phalanges as well as the middle phalanges. Um, and then they go on to say, Stern and Sussman go on to describe the small bones of the wrist, the pisiform and trapezium, which are markedly different between humans and apes. Again, canines and dogs. They note that afarensis pisiform re resembles the pisiform of Apes and monkeys in the trapezium closely resembles the corresponding joint in chimpanzee. A wrist morphology that is strikingly similar to African apes is consistent with later findings by Richmond and Strait, that's Brian Richmond, we'll talk about him in just a second, when examining Lucy Skeleton. These paleo experts have observed, based on certain diagnostic features of the distal radius, the large lower arm bone closest to the wrist, that Lucy had a locking wrist that stabilized the joint. This morphology is, quote, classic for knuckle walkers, showing that Lucy was a quadruped that moved about on all fours like modern chimps and gorillas, not upright on two feet like humans. Richmond and Street report in the journal Nature, and they go on to talk about the distal radius and how it supports a knuckle walking interpretation. John Flegel, graduate of Harvard and paleo expert from Stony Brook, commented, these features in early hominid bones can't be explained except that they're uniquely related to knuckle walking. Now, Let's talk about the hand and knuckle walking claims that Contested Bones just talked about. I guess we'll finish this last little paragraph first. 
While textbooks and media promote a very one-sided view of Afarensis as our upright walking ancestor, a significant portion, perhaps the majority, of leading paleo experts and anatomists insist on just the opposite. The real Lucy looked nothing like our textbook images and museum displays. Rather, Lucy had hands and feet like those of modern-day tree-dwelling primates. Figure seven. It's just, it's just a picture of a chimpanzee. <laughs> It says Lucy's skeleton lacks the diagnostic bones of the hands and feet. Consequently, it is not possible to clearly discern the foot anatomy of Lucy. However, Lucy's preserved limb bone distal radius indicate the presence of a knocking wrist, etc., etc., etc. Rather, Lucy had hands and feet like those of modern true dwelling primates. Having the feet and hands of a chimpanzee, Lucy and her kind could not possibly have one been strong walkers, two had human posture, three had human gait, or four formed late totally footprints. She was a tree swinging ape, and needless to say, could not do calculus. So let's talk about these hands. There is no doubt that Australopithecus afarensis has some curved phalanges, and I think that you can reasonably say that it at least retained the ability to be arboreal. I'm not so sure about the idea that fingers curve plastically with stress loading to the degree that we see in Australopithecus afarensis, so I think it's possible that it's a retention or there might have been, again, some arboreality going on. I tend to side with those who say, yeah, like there's a lot of bipedalism and some arboreality uh, because humans still do arboreal behaviors as well. Like there are certain human communities today that still engage in a lot of tree climbing to exploit certain resources. And of course, little kids climb all the time. But that being said, it's never as simple as contested bones wants to make it out to be. While the while the phalanges are curved, and while this can be associated with arboreal behaviors, this is not the only trait that the hands have. This is a 2003 paper titled Morphological Affinities of the Australopithecus Afarensis Hand on the Basis of Manual Proportions and Relative Thumb Length. So not just looking at the distal phalanges, this paper specifically looks at the manipulative abilities of the hands of Australopithecus Afarensis. In the abstract, it says the hands of apes and humans differ considerably with regard to proportions between several bones. Of critical significance is the long thumb relative to the other fingers, which is the basis for human-like pad-to-pad -pad precision grip capability and has been considered by some as evidence for tool making. The nature and timing of the evolutionary transition from ape-like to human-like manual proportions, however, have remained unclear as a result of the lack of appropriate fossil material. In this article, the manual proportions of Australopithecus afarensis from the locality AL333, so this is, again, we're still looking at the Hadar samples, are investigated by means of bivariate and multivariate morphometric analyses in order to test the hypothesis of human-like proportions, including an enhanced thumb-to-hand relationship originally evolved as an adaptation to stone tool making. Although some evidence for human-like manual proportions have been previously proposed for this taxon, conclusive evidence was lacking. Our results indicate that Australopithecus afarensis possessed the overall manual proportions, including an increased thumb-to-hand relationship that, contrary to previous reports, is fully human and would have permitted pad-to-pad human-like precision grip capability. We show that these human-like hand proportions in Australopithecus afarensis result mainly from hand shortening, as in modern humans, and that these conclusions are robust enough to be non-dependent on whether or not the bones belong to a single individual or not. So they've even, they've, it's such a robust analysis that it doesn't even matter that we have a one single fully preserved hand from one single individual. Um, since Australopithecus afarensis predates the appearance of stone tools, the above mentioned conclusions permit a confident refutation of the null hypothesis that human-like manual proportions are an adaptation to stone tool making and thus alternative explanations must therefore be sought. So they're basically making the argument that the ability to manipulate tools with our hands is something of an exaptation, excuse me. So we're predisposed to that, but that's not why this precision grip evolved in the first place. That's kind of beside the point. I just wanted to bring this up to show that the overall hand of Australopithecus afarensis is mosaic. It has human-like proportions, but the phalanges are curved. This is why I think it's reasonable to suggest that those arboreal retentions are perhaps being put to use, but overall the hand is moving, quote unquote, in a certain direction, right? There's directional selection to, to move away from this arboreality, although this is directional only in retrospective. Um, so <laughs> I, just, I just don't understand why this isn't included. Like, why aren't we doing these full analyses? The, the answer is very clear. Everyone already knows. The reason is because contested bones went in with a conclusion. 
They are not using the evidence to form a conclusion. They go in with the conclusion and look for evidence to support it. This is why they cherry pick their data like pretty consistently. You'll notice that a lot of the papers that we've gone through aren't in contested bones and yet they did exist at the time of publishing. So this means they were purposefully ignored because this is meant to be like a robust refutation of human evolution, um, which is why the fact that it's this thick is already worrisome. It, it, this is not a long enough text to refute a, a gigantic, a full field within science, biological anthropology. But now we need to talk about the knuckle walking thing because this is actually an interesting proposal that deserves a look. It deserves a look-see. So this is the original paper that they're referring to in Contested Bones, Evidence that Humans Evolved from a Knuckle-Walking Ancestor by Richmond and Strait. This is a pretty famous paper. Most people in biological anthropology know about it. it came out in 2000, as you can see here. And the case is basically made that the distal radius, which is an anatomical position with thumbs out to the side, it's this bone here, this lateral bone towards your thumb, that the distal radius of Australopithecus afarensis is similar enough to knuckle walkers that there may have been some kind of retained locking there. Now, critically, Richmond and Strait are not arguing that Lucy was a knuckle walker. The, the, the seminal paper that Contested Bones is trying to use to make their point that Lucy is this quadrupedal knuckle walking ape completely analogous to modern knuckle walking apes, that's not even the case they're making here. Richmond and Strait rather argue that this presence suggests that Lucy evolved from a knuckle walking ancestor. They don't think that she did no bipedalism. In fact, again, like this, this is a running theme. They're constantly trying to present the idea that Lucy is a, as an obligate quadruped on the ground is something that anybody holds. It's not. Even Sarmiento doesn't hold that. He just holds that there's more quadrupedalism than bipedalism and that subsequently we evolved from something that was quadrupedal on the ground rather than the arboreal suspensory hypothesis. It's deceptive and it really, really irritates me. So let's see what they say specifically here so that we know where they're coming from. In the abstract, it says bipedalism has been traditionally regarded as the fundamental adaptation that sets hominids apart from other primates. Fossil evidence demonstrates that by 4.1 million years ago, and perhaps earlier, hominins exhibited adaptations to bipedal walking. At present, however, the fossil record offers little information about the origin of bipedalism, and despite nearly a century of research on existing fossils and comparative anatomy, there still exists no consensus regarding the locomotion that preceded bipedalism. Here we present evidence that the fossils attributed to Australopithecus anamensis and Australopithecus afarensis retain specialized wrist morphology associated with knuckle walking. This distal radial morphology differs from that of later hominids and non-knuckle walking anthropoid primates, suggesting that knuckle walking is a derived feature of the African ape and human clade. This removes key morphological evidence for the pan gorilla clade and suggests that bipedal hominids evolved from a knuckle walking ancestor that was already partly terrestrial. So, some key words here. One, already exhibiting bipedal adaptations, exhibited adaptations for bipedal walking, and retention of specialized wrist morphology. They are not arguing that Lucy knuckle walked. In fact, I don't think anybody argues that Lucy knuckle walked. Even Sarmiento, with his fringe idea of quadrupedalism, thinks that it's palmigrade. So, Already we have problems with the contested bones idea here, but I actually want to take a minute and present the case that Lucy didn't have that distal uh, potential um, wrist locking feature that's retained. I don't even think that that's legit. This is my opinion. So I'm going to present some uh, literature to back up that idea, even though it doesn't matter for our purposes because already full stop right here, Richmond and Strait's article does not support the conclusion. Oops. Sorry, getting too passionate. The conclusions that Contested Bones actually reaches. So they're just massacring the literature here and trying to force it to say something that it abjectly does not say. I'm sure you've heard me say this phrase on the channel before. But let's move on to another paper to kind of support my ideas here. This is a paper that came out in 2009 by Kivel and Schmidt. And the title of the paper is Independent Evolution of Knuckle Walking in African Apes shows that humans did not evolve from a knuckle walking ancestor. So this is more recent than, uh, than Richmond's paper. And what it basically looks like, or what it basically looks at is the difference between the knuckle walking mechanisms in gorillas and chimps. And their argument is basically that 
because the knuckle walking mechanism is different and they do propose that it's different, that knuckle walking evolved twice in each of these groups. And this supports the idea that because humans and chimps are more closely related than either is to a gorilla, that the ancestor of humans and chimps was thus not a knuckle walker. So it says, despite decades of debate, it remains unclear whether human bipedalism evolved from a terrestrial knuckle walking ancestor or a more generalized arboreal ape ancestor. Proponents of the knuckle walking hypothesis focused on the wrist and hand to find morphological evidence of this behavior in the human fossil record. This study, however, these studies, however, have not examined variation or development of purported knuckle walking features in apes or other primates, uh, data that are critical to the resolution of this long standing debate. Here we present novel data on the frequency and development of putative, or putative excuse me, knuckle walking features in the wrists of apes and monkeys. We use this data to test the hypothesis that all knuckle walking apes share similar anatomical features and that these features can be used to reliably infer locomotor behaviors in our extinct ancestors. Contrary to previous expectations, features long assumed to indicate knuckle walking behavior are not found in all African apes, show different developmental patterns across the species and are found in non knuckle walking primates as well. However, variation among African ape wrist morphology can clearly be explained if we accept the likely independent evolution of two fundamentally different bio biomechanical modes of knuckle walking, an extended wrist posture in an, in an arboreal environment, pan, versus a neutral columnar hand posture in a terrestrial environment, gorilla. The presence of purported knuckle walking features in the hominin wrist can thus be viewed as evidence of arboreality not terrestriality, and provide evidence that human bipedalism evolved from a more arboreal ancestor occupying the ecological niche common to all living apes. Now, this is a free paper, so you can check this one out. The Richmond one is not, which is why, <laughs> which is why I did not show all of it. But they look at the specific morphologies of wrist bones and, you know, how this relates to the mode of muck walking that gorillas and chimpanzees exhibit. And this paper received quite a bit of pushback from sort of the knuckle walking crowd. I'm not saying that this completely overturns the knuckle walking hypothesis. Although if we look more into the literature, we can find further, <laughs> further papers that have come out. This one I actually find more compelling by Tallman in 2012. It's titled Morphology of the Distal Radius and Extant Hominoids and Fossil Hominins, Implications for the Evolution of Bipedalism. And we're just going to look at the abstract. Maybe I think we'll look at some of the pictures here. This one is also free online, so no copyright problems here. And they say one of the longstanding arguments about the evolution of bipedality centers in the locomotor pattern used by the last common ancestor of apes and humans. In particular, knuckle walking has been suggested as this locomotor pattern on the basis of shared morphology in the upper limb bones of African apes and humans and the phylogenetic parsimony. Because when we're looking at the sort of steps that it takes to go from an ancestor to humans, it's more parsimonious when we're including the hominines, so gorillas and chimpanzees, to suppose that knuckle walking evolved once in the ancestor of humans, gorillas, and chimps, and then humans sort of lost that ability and chimps and gorillas retained it. But what is most parsimonious is not always what is correct, as we know. So if the if the evidence sort of pushes us in the other direction that knuckle walking evolved independently in gorillas and chimps, the support for which would be this paper here showing that the knuckle walking is a different type in each of these animals, well, then the parsimony for the steps is kind of losing to the morphologic evidence. So they use geometric morphometrics and were testing whether or not the distal radius of extant hominoids is sufficient for determining locomotor patterns and the affiliations of plyopleistocene hominins to the extant taxa. Results indicate that while the entire radius differentiates extant taxa very well by locomotor pattern, the distal radius fails to clearly differentiate the extant taxa. So what they were doing is they were looking at that same bone, Richmond Strait looked at the, the radius, but they note that it's only when you have the entire bone that you can properly predict the morphology or the locomotor uh, pattern, excuse me, of the animal the radius belongs to. Now, critically, Richmond and Strait over here, over here, these guys looked at the distal radius specifically. So that's not going to be as informative, right? This casts a lot of doubt on this paper. As you can see here, the distal radial morphology is what they looked at. Distal means far away from the body. So they're specifically looking at the radius near the wrist, what it looks like near the wrist. 
So they continue, the sigmoid notch of the distal radius is an anatomical feature that differs most among the extant taxa, and its variability broadly correlates with the necessary mobility of the wrist joint. Principal components in discriminant function analysis indicate that early hominins are affiliated with a variety of extant taxa with different locomotor patterns. Overall, the bony anatomy of the distal radius of early hominins points towards something adapted to a wide variety of locomotor postures. And then the last thing that I kind of wanted to talk about is the hominin that precedes Australopithecus, which is already Pithecus, which of course Contested Bones considers to be just Australopithecus. This is insane and not in accordance with how we categorize modern animals. Already Pithecus is super different from Australopithecus. If you found them both living today, there's no way you would classify them within the same genus. But Contested Bones doesn't care about that. Anyways, this, this is an article by, I actually know Cody Prong right here, uh, Thomas Cody Prong. I met him at the ABAs, and this is a paper on Artipithecus' hand. And they argue that the hand of Artipithecus, which in the Tim White camp is supposed to be, it's supposed to be anagenetic, right? So you have Artipithecus, then Australopithecus anamensis, then Australopithecus afarensis, that's sort of the idea. But generally, even though the, the broader paleoanthropological community doesn't accept this sort of strict anagenetic transfer, or lineage rather, um, it is accepted that Artipithecus is a hominin, and perhaps the common ancestor of hominins that come after it. And Artipithecus's hand shows suspensory adaptations, not knuckle-walking ones. So they looked at the morphology of this individual, Artie, and they note that it is uh, suspensory. It's indicative of a suspensory lifestyle. However, the hand of the 4.4 million year old hominin Artipithecus remnus purportedly provides evidence that the hominin hand was derived from a more generalized form. Here we use morphometric and phylogenetic comparative methods to show that Artipithecus retains suspensory adapted hand morphology shared with chimpanzees and bonobos. We identify an evolutionary shift in hand morphology between Artipithecus and Australopithecus that renews the questions about the coevolution of hominin manipulative capabilities and obligate bipedalism initially proposed by Darwin. Overall, our results suggest that early hominins evolved from an ancestor with a varied positional repertoire, including suspension and vertical climbing, directly affecting the viable range of hypotheses for the origin of our lineage. So we just looked at a couple different papers, all of which sort of converged to say, no, Lucy was not a knuckle walker and potentially didn't even have the uh, distal wrist morphology indicative of one. So with that out of the way, a <laughs> long-winded sort of explanation for why contested bones. And, and like what I've done here isn't even a sufficient literature search to support my point. Like if we really wanted to get into it, we would read all of these papers taking um, nice notes over the course of the entire thing and then look for the comments that went against our papers and sort of come into, you know, come to a synthesis of the current state of the literature. Uh, although I will tell you ahead of time that the, the consensus does seem to be not the knuckle walking hypothesis. It comes, you know, generalized arboreal Mycene ape tends to be the idea today. But like Contested Bones, who is overturning paleoanthropology, just did not do any of that, did they? None of these papers, except for the Richmond and Strait one we started with, are even cited in this chapter of the text, which is, of course, very concerning. Let's reread that last sentence of this little section. <laughs> Having the feet and hands of a chimpanzee, Lucy and her kind could not possibly have, one, been strong walkers. We debunked that right off the bat by looking at the foot morphology of the various different fossil representations of the feet and ankles. Two, had human posture. They didn't even talk about posture in the previous chapters, like in the previous sections, rather, the paragraphs. We didn't even go over it. But to take a minute to show you that they did have human posture, the orthograde upright posture, let's look at the difference between some skulls. As you can see, the foramen magnums are very different for the two bipeds than they are for the single quadruped. Three had a human gait. We didn't talk about gait either. <laughs> I don't know why they're suggesting that we even mentioned it. It's it's just completely absent from the paragraphs that we talked about. Four formed the Laetuli footprints. This is weird for them to say because the main Laetuli footprint section follows, so we'll put a pin in that. And then they say she was a tree swinging ape and needless to say could not do calculus. So let's talk about the Laetuli footprints. Let's read about this. 
This leaves us with the mystery of Lily Tolly footprints, which Scientific American describes as the world's oldest whodunit, an unsolved mystery. And then that citation is from 2005. So we've, we've done a little bit of work since then, I would propose. <laughs> They go on and say, if neither Lucy's kind nor any other Australopithecine can be credited with having made the Lentoli footprints, where did they come from? Okay, they didn't establish their case there, but let's let them continue. Aware of this problem, Russell Tuttle, former researcher of the Lentoli footprints, suggests a far-fetched idea. In any case, we should shelve a loose assumption that the Lentoli footprints were made by Lucy's kind. The Lentoli footprints hint at at least one other hominid that roamed Africa at the same time. Here, Tuttle encourages paleo experts to abandon the idea that Lucy's kind made the Tolly footprints. Uh, this is a citation from 1990. So well before any of the biomechanics work was actually carried out, well before we even found the other trackways. Now, interestingly enough, Tuttle is right here. There was another hominin roaming. Of course, it's completely unrelated to the fact that Australopithecus afarensis made the G trackway, but there was another hominin that made what's called the A trackway, as I mentioned earlier, and it's not the same type of biped that Lucy is. It's much more primitive, and yet it's walking on two feet, which is very interesting. It's actually, as a quick side note, it's so primitive, its feet are so wide that they they kicked around the idea that an upright bear might have made the tracks. Not a bear that was like habitually upright, but bears in the wild here in the United States, like black bears sometimes walk up on two feet. They walk bipedally for like extremely short distances. And so they kicked around the idea that maybe it just so happened there was an ursin hanging around when this volcanic eruption occurred that stood up on two feet and made a couple of footprints. They actually tested this by making bears walk in an ash-like substrate and then comparing that to chimpanzees and humans. And they found that no, they weren't made by an ursid. They were made by some kind of more primitive wide-footed hominin, which is fascinating. The, the footprints are, they're even less human looking than like totally footprints by a lot, but still it's, it's neat to think about. Instead, he proposes that, okay, we already went over that. Tuttle is essentially imagining a very apish looking creature with anatomically modern human feet that coexisted with Lucy, figure eight. You should be arrested for putting this picture into a text. So you guys have probably seen this paper before. I bring this one up a lot when we're talking about the Laetoli footprints because it's a really good paper. So it's titled Laetoli footprints reveal bipedal gait biomechanics different from those of modern humans and chimpanzees. This is obviously a very informative paper with regard to the question of who made the Laetoli footprints, because if contested bones is correct and they were just made by people, then these biomechanics should reflect that, right? The biomechanics of the Laetoli prints should look indistinguishable from humans. As I've been saying over and over again in response to this assertion by contested bones, it is not the case that they're indistinguishable from modern humans. Now, before we move on I, I, to cover this, I want to cover very quickly what they say next. They say, might there be a more reasonable explanation for this? Is it possible that humans formed the human-looking Laetoli footprints just as the anatomy suggests, except the anatomy does not suggest this? Tuttle acknowledges this would be the more reasonable explanation. Tuttle writes, if the G footprints were not so old, we would readily conclude they were made by a member of our own genus, Homo. So this is from 1990 again, and <laughs> what he's referring to here is not Homo sapiens. He's talking about a member of our genus, probably something like Homo habilis, a very primitive member of our own genus. But contested bones doesn't take it that way and instead say, however, paleo experts refuse to credit the footprints to humans, as in modern humans, as in members of Homo. We don't, we still don't know what they mean when they say humans because it is widely assumed that Homo had not yet evolved at the time of Lucy, and the days for Australopithecus afarensis and the late Tuli footprints are infallible. In chapter 12, we will learn that potassium organ dating methods used to date the late Tuli footprints is highly consistent and often an error. And then they go on to a radiometric dating tirade that is very brief, and then they are finished with the late Tuli footprints. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these prints, and we're going to look at this paper here first. So remembering first and foremost that the anatomy of the Laetoli footprints as far as what they appear to look like, while familiar is not identical to many types of uh, human footprints that we know are left by Homo sapiens within the fossil record, these sort of ignites, right? All right, so bipedal is a key adaptation that shaped human evolution, yet the timing and nature of its evolution remain unclear. Here we use new experimentally based approaches to investigate the locomotor mechanics preserved by the famous Pliocene hominid footprints from Laetoli, Tanzania. Boy, experimental. 
directly observable in the present. That sounds like something that contested bones would really like. We conducted footprint formation experiments with habitually barefoot humans and chimpanzees to quantitatively compare their footprints to those compared or preserved at Laetoli. Our results show that the Laetoli footprints are morphologically distinct from those of both chimpanzees and habitually barefoot modern humans. By analyzing biomechanical data that were collected during the human experiments, we, for the first time, directly link differences between the Laetoli, moder the Laetoli and modern human footprints to specific biomechanic variables. We find that the Laetoli hominin probably used more flexed limb posture at the foot strike than modern humans when walking bipedally. The Laetoli footprints provide a clear snapshot of an early hominin bipedal gait that probably involved a limb posture that was slightly but significantly different from our own. And these data support the hypothesis that the important evolutionary changes to hominin bipedalism occurred within the past 3.66 million years. Okay, so that's like a nice abstract, right? But I really want to look for a minute. I mean, we know how they did it. They they took an ash-like substrate and had human hunter-gatherers walk through it, chimpanzees walk through it, and then they compared the prints to those left at Lake Tolley. And we get some really, really uh, informative graphics here. I like this one the best. You've probably seen it on this channel before. It says examples of human, so here on the left, the Laetoli homin here in the middle, and chimpanzee footprints. These randomly selected footprints demonstrate the stereotypical morphologies from left to right. Human, Laetoli hominin, and chimpanzee. The human and chimpanzee prints were, were produced experimentally. Laetoli footprint shown here is G25, G125 rather. Um, you can see the depth kind of the topography of these footprints, which kind of helps us understand the differences between them. There's a big heavy heel in this hominin here. And of course the toe is in line, right? But it's much more robust seemingly than what we see in human, much more like a chimp. Isn't that fascinating? We've got some nice statistics here as well. I'll put this in the description so you can investigate it further if you'd like. But here we have a nice proportional depth comparison showing that the Laetoli prints match more with humans but are not entirely within sort of the human mean or near to the human mean. Here are the Laetoli prints again. This is a comparison of the midfoot depth. And uh, then they go in with their funding and sort of their, their conclusions. Ultimately, these reports support the hypothesis that the evolution of human bipedalism was a process during which slightly but significantly different gait kinematics. Boy, I thought, wait a second, Contessa Bunn said that the gait was human though. Hmm, weird. Kinematics and morphology evolved in different hominin taxa. Regardless of the environment and evolutionary circumstances that surround the Laetoli track makers, direct evidence from the Laetoli footprint suggests that the Pliocene hominins at Laetoli, probably but not certainly Australopithecus afarensis, employed a form of bipedalism that was well-developed but not equivalent to what is seen in modern humans today. While the postcranial anatomy required for a well-developed bipedal gait may have emerged at an earlier date and persisted for a long time, it remains to be seen when, how, and why the specific biomechanics of modern human bipedalism evolved. So, <laughs> Uh, okay, this is completely in contrast to what Contested Bones is arguing, is it not? And this paper was out, I believe it's 2016, but I'm not positive. Yeah, 2016, before the publishing of Contested Bones. So why isn't it covered? Oh, wait a second, Brian Richmond, the knuckle-walking hypothesis guy is involved in this. Well, boy, why isn't his authority recognized here? This is a paper that I'll also stick in the description. Um, I have access to it, but it's through my university, so you might have to peruse a science hub if you really want to check it out. But this discusses the other footprint site, the A site that I was talking about with these big, wide, <laughs> weird footprints that were from a different hominin. So the Laetoli footprint shows something that is intermediate, and the foot morphology shows something that is intermediate, and the hand morphology shows something that is intermediate all slightly closer to the human side of things, although still in between sort of a generalized Miocene ape form and the modern human form. Interesting. It's the complete opposite of what Contestant Bones is arguing. And they're just being dishonest about the Laetoli prints. Every time they say that it's indistinguishable from modern human footprints, that's simply not true. And we have the data to back that up. And they had the data to back up the opposite of their stance. But they chose not to go over that. They, they don't even bring it up to say why it's wrong or to say, don't worry about this. They're, they're evil evolutionists, right? They just don't, they just ignore it, uh, which is not appropriate, uh, particularly for a book that's trying to overturn the paradigm. So moving on, they talk about, they complain, I guess I should say, about uh, radiometric dating. So let's talk about that for a minute. 
So they talk about the dates and how the dates were initially incorrect or no, they weren't. They just talk about different types of data and potassium argon, things like that. Um, they say this is obviously not an objective or foolproof dating method. They get mad about specifically potassium argon as if that's the only type of radiometric dating that exists and as if there's nothing else to corroborate it. They say it is crucial to realize that the dating methods used to date Lucy and the Lately footprints, potassium argon and argon argon, are both based on the decay of potassium into argon, except for argon argon, which is known to give highly discordant dates as recorded as reported in well-respected scientific journals. I put, oh, I see. That's just what they wrote. They just said, trust us, well-sourced scientific journals and highly respected scientific journals agree with us. There is, of course, no citation for that. That is just completely blatantly asserted. Now, we could talk about the fact that radiometric dating is the backbone of the fossil fuel industry, how we use it to base and model and find things like oil, natural gas, and coal, and how that very fact really just opens and shuts this case, right? Really just makes this a non-issue because there's obviously a monetary motivation here. So the, the oil barons don't really care if young earth creationism or evolution is correct. They just want to make money. So they use what works. And it just so happens that that's radiometric dating. So, you know, a, a multi-trillion dollar industry over the decades is um, in support of radiometric dating. But then we could also talk about the fact that if radiometric dating doesn't work, then you have to explain the data that we have. If the, the, the things aren't really that age, if the ratio of parent to daughter that we have is wrong, you have to explain why it's wrong. And usually the way that young earth creationists do this is they propose accelerated nuclear decay. This is something that does not work without an appeal to miracles, because if you accelerate the nuclear decay in the year of Noah's flood, or even give them 6,000 years, this is enough heat that the entire, the entire Earth is going to be vaporized down to the granitic crust. Um, some versions of this also incorporate speedups of other processes, and you get something like hydroplate or CPT, which is just such an absurd amount of energy that the upper limit of, of these models has, you know, 22 Hiroshima bombs per square meter of Earth. Not going to work. Not reasonable in my, in my sort of um, view. You know, I could be biased, but you can check out some of my other videos. I'll put links into the description that go into the math of that, how we actually get those numbers for CPT, which is the model I assume that contested bones would support, and the much more ridiculous hydroplate. Uh, but the bottom line is, one, you need the mechanism to speed up the decay. Two, you need a miracle to mitigate the consequences of speeding up the decay. Uh, and they don't have either of those. And then this is completely separate from the support that radiometric decay has, both in its use in the energy industry and the other corroborating methods. So things like ice cores, dendrochronology, um, things like thermoluminescence, right? The rate of <laughs> at which the continents are spreading apart also matches um, or, or radiometric dates. So, you know, it's gonna be a tough one. It's gonna be a tough fight. Um, okay, so then they say, indeed, there's extensive evidence that newer volcanic eruptions of known age have occurred in the recent past often yield very old radiometric dates. Table one of chapter 12 provides a list of recent volcanic eruptions that have yielded dates of millions of years when dated using argon measurements. This recurrent problem of excess argon has been widely reported. The problems with potassium argon dating are discussed more in chapter 12. And then they say, if we can't trust, trust the dating, then how do we even know when Lucy lived? How do we even know that we can corroborate this australopith with the tracks? Now, I've talked about the discordant dates with the recent volcanic eruptions a zillion times on this channel. But for those of you who may just be watching this video, discordant dates are gleaned from radiometrically dating new volcanic eruptions 100 times out of 100 because it's against the methodology of radiometric dating. There is quite literally not enough parent material that has to cave into daughter material to even get a signal. So it's just noise. That's why it's always, there's no rhyme or reason to the types of wrong radiometric dates that you get when you date these new volcanic eruptions. Now, you might be saying, well, boy, that sounds convenient. How do we know that that's actually the case? Well, one, it's just a part of the physics behind the methodology, but two, when enough parent material has decayed of volcanic eruptions of known age, like say Mount Vesuvius, we get calendar dates. We get, we get volcanic eruption radiometric dates that match the historic dates to the calendar year. So this is a process that works when, we, when we're actually following the correct methodology, when enough parent material has decayed to actually measure. Okay. 
But we'll get to that more in depth when we get to chapter 12. But I'm, I'm just really sick and tired of Young Earth Creations taking issue with radiometric dating um, and using the same lame excuses every time that have been debunked by scientists far greater than myself. Um, okay, the knee joint attributed to Lucy's kind, similar to an orangutan. Oh, okay, interesting. I can't wait to see where this goes. During the first field season of the International AFAR uh, Research Expedition in 1973, Johansson found the upper end of the shin bone <laughs> protruding from the sand. They, at least they did put proximal tibia there. Its size suggested to him that it belonged to a monkey. A few yards away, he found the lower end of a thigh bone, the distal femur. He fit them together to form an e-joint. The fit was at an angle. The angle at which the thigh bone meets the shin bone is known as the carrying angle. Chimps and gorillas have a zero degree carrying angle. I don't think it's exactly zero degrees. Uh, the two bones stand straight up and down. This makes them walk in an, offer, in an awkward side-to-side waddle. Humans, on the other hand, have a carrying angle of around 9 degrees. This means that the two femurs point to inward towards a knock-kneed position. The knee joint found by Johansson had a carrying angle of 15 degrees. When he saw the angle, he recalls, I immediately thought a man-like knee joint means man-like walking. Johansson even concluded that when he found the hominid knee joint, the oldest one ever found at the time. He even concluded this when he found it. The knee joint has been subject to much controversy Okay, interesting. Significantly, it was not associated with Lucy's skeleton. I don't care. Um, all of these individuals, again, found in Hadar that are associated with being Australopith are because they have the diagnostic characteristics of the species. Uh, all right. This was a full year, blah, 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 talking about when they found them. Nevertheless, they're convinced that it belongs to Lucy's species. The claim is questionable. No citation. Um, paleo experts uh, have called into question the claim that the high carrying angle proves Lucy and her kind walked upright like humans. So... Nothing proves anything really in science. It's not really the goal. And it's also not just the knee. It's the knee in accordance with the other characteristics that Australopithecus afarensis had. We will be covering this momentarily. Johansson reasoned that since the knee joint had a high carrying angle, even more than humans, this supported his claim that Lucy and her, that Lucy and her kind walked in an upright, um, in an upright fashion and were ancestors to man. However, what is not mentioned is the fact that spider monkeys and orangutans also have a high carrying angle. Therefore, the high carrying angle cannot be used as, a, as evidence of habitual upright locomotion. In spider monkeys and orangutans, a high carrying angle enables them to put one foot in front of the other, as in the require, what is required to walk along a branch. Upon careful analysis of the head or knee joint, Stern and Sussman reported, among monkeys and apes, the greatest degree of the valgus angles found by Ateles and Pogo. So this is Pogo. Adelies and Pongo. This is your um, your spider monkey genus and your orangutans. Pogo. Uh, as, mentioned, but as mentioned by Halizek in 1972, the values for a bicondylar angle in 14 species of orangutan and 7 species of spider monkey overlap his range of 21 humans. Then they make the following conclusion. In summary, the knee of the small Hadar hominin shares with other australopithecines a marked obliquity of the the moral shaft relative to the bicondylar angle, but in all other respects, it falls outside the range of modern human variation, or barely within. Since, aside from the degree of the valgus knee, the knee of the small Hadar hominid possesses no modern trait to a pronounced degree, and since many of these traits uh, may not serve to specify the precise nature of bipedality that was practiced, we must agree with Tardu that the overall structure of the knee is compatible with a significant degree of arboreal locomotion. So, what I said here is, it is not modern. Right, so Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, at least in my opinion, and what I feel is the consensus of the paleoanthropological community, as mentioned earlier in this video, is that Lucy species did bipedally walk when on the ground, but that it still went up into the trees sometimes. So what they're arguing for here is that it's not incompatible with arboreality, the valgus nature of the knee, because there are arboreal primates with a uh, um, uh, bicondylar angle that still that are clearly aren't bipeds, right? I believe gibbons also fall into this. So let's talk about the knee for a second because um, one, this is again from the 1983 paper and there has been quite a bit of work on Australopithecus afarensis since then. But more importantly, I, I just think we should look at the femurs here. We should look at the femurs and we should look at knees. And I'm going to leave it to you to decide whether or not these these um, there's a reasonable claim to be had that it, it's quite similar to humans with regard to the carrying angle and that this is not indicative of the same type of bicondylar angle seen in spider monkeys and orangutans. So we're going to assess some knees here today using the distal ends of some femurs. Here's a human femur. It's pretty robust. You have really 
beat someone to death with it, if you gave it a conscious effort. This isn't a real human femur, this is a, a model of a human femur. And it's very easy to assess the valgus nature. You simply take it and place it on the table vertically like this so that the condyles of the femur are uh, flat on the table and you look and see if there's an angle, right? And as you can see, there clearly is one. The knee of a human is valgus so that the weight can be held directly above and below the body. It's that easy. Compare that to a chimpanzee femur. <laughs> This is also not a real chimpanzee femur, thank God, a uh, replica. And you can run the same test, condyles on the ground, condyles on the table, hold it up. And there is an angle. It's less extreme if you were to measure it, right? You can hold them side by side, and you can see that the human angle is more extreme than the chimpanzee angle to accommodate a uh, an upright posture, right? And remember, this is the acetabulum here. So when you're holding the chimpanzee femur and putting it in, you have to also appreciate the fact that its legs tend to sprawl out to the side quite a bit more. So when it's in contact with the knee itself, the angle is also less extreme. Now here is a replica of Australopithecus afarensis. Right? This is a, a true replica of one of the knees that was found, specifically the one that they're talking about in contested bones. This is the distal end of the femur. This is the proximal end of the tibia. And what you can do is you can do a tabletop test with this itself. Simply set it on top of the table, take a pen or something along those lines and place it in the center to see whether or not you would end up with an angle. And of course you do. In fact, it's, it's very similar to that of a human. And there's a great, there's a couple of really great uh, visuals out there that I'll put on the screen now for you to see. The point being uh, that the, the knee of Australopithecus afarensis is remarkably derived. And it's even easier to see that when you have a human knee to compare it to, which I do. I also check this bad boy out. There is a patella in the way, so it's hard to kind of see and appreciate to its full extent, but you can turn them around and see them from behind and appreciate at least a little bit better how similar these two things really are. They're reversed, right? So left left versus right here. Um, they're remarkably familiar to one another. And this is to the exclusion of the chimpanzee, which is fascinating to think about. So with sort of our knees out of the way, we can also appreciate the nature of the femurs. And I talked about this in my previous video on bipedality, but if we look at the femoral head of an Australopithecus femur, it's got a long neck to it. The head is here. It's a pretty, it's pretty uh, robust. When we're comparing it to the human and the chimpanzee, because it's smaller, it's hard to see a precise comparison, but in overall size and shape, it not only looks more like the human as compared to the chimpanzee, but the more important, <laughs> the more important comparison is actually in the distribution of cortical bone. Again, I talked about this in my bipedality video, but cortical bone is a very tough type of bone as opposed to the spongy bone that exists in all of our bones. And it tends to model itself where areas of stress are highest. So if something is a biped, you would expect there to be quite a bit of cortical bone in the neck of the femur. And this is in fact the case when we look at Australopithecus afarensis. The cortical bone is thickest in the head and neck of the femur, which matches the human condition to the exclusion, again, of chimpanzees where the cortical bone in the neck is not as thick. And these two really have a similar condition, right? Why might that be? Probably because they're loading stress in the same way for bipedal locomotion. So this is from a paper all the way back in 1997, which of course begs the question, why didn't contested bones know about it? I know we keep asking it, but it remains relevant. Titled Cortical Bone Distribution in the Femoral Neck of Hominoids, Implications for the Locomotion of Australopithecus afarensis. So what they did is they took uh, high resolution computed tomography images at a 1.5 millimeter slice thickness perpendicular to the neck axis from the base of the femoral head to the trochanteric line in a sample of 10 specimens of Homo sapiens, Pantroglodytes, and gorillas, plus five specimens of bonobos, Panpaniscus. Now, what they did was they compared this to our Australopiths, and what they say down here, throughout the femoral neck, Homo sapiens displays thin superior cortical bone and inferior cortical bone that thickens distally. So what that means is that the cortical bone is thin superiorly, so up here it's thinner where the stress is lighter, and it's thick here in the inferior portion, and it thickens distally, so it gets thicker as you move down the neck. 
of the femur. In marked contrast, cortical bone in the form of the oral neck of, of, African na eh, of African apes is uniformly thick in all directions, with even greater thickening of the superior cortical bone distally. Because the femoral neck acts as a cantilevered beam, its anchorage at the neck shaft junction is subjected to the highest bending stresses and biomechanically relevant, and is a biomechanically relevant region to inspect response to strain. So as evinced by AL-128-1 and AL-211-1 and MAK mac vp one Australopithecus afarensis is indistinguishable from Homo sapiens, but markedly different from African apes in cortical bone distribution at the femoral neck shaft junction. Cortical distribution in African apes indicates much greater variation in loading conditions consistent with their more varied locomotor repertoire. Cortical distribution in homino or in hominids, excuse me, in is a response to the more stereotypic loading pattern imposed by habitual bipedality, and thin superior cortex in Australopithecus afarensis confirms the absence of a significant arboreal component in its locomotor repertoire. So here's a nice little picture of what we were just talking about. So from left to right, here's our chimpanzee, then Australopithecus afarensis and Homo sapiens. And again, this is superior up here and inferior is down below. So in sort of accordance with what we just read, we should expect the cortical bone to be thickest inferiorly for bipeds and thinnest superiorly. And what we see is more uniform distribution here in the chimpanzee. Over on the human, remarkably thick inferiorly and thin superiorly. And what do we see with Australopithecus afarensis? It's thick inferiorly and thin superiorly, mimicking the human condition. So I think it's safe to say that the femur of Australopithecus afarensis is that probably of a biped and not an arboreal quadruped or knuckle walker. Contrary to what contested bones is telling you to think, and contrary to the literature, I guess, that they feel is worth discussing. So to summarize our knee situation, Contested Bones argues that the knee of Lucy doesn't matter because you can also find a carrying angle in organisms like spider monkeys and orangutans. One, and I didn't point this out earlier, so I'm going to point it now, the key words here is that there is overlap, not that they are one-to-one -one the same. So spider monkeys and orangutans overlap into the human range, but they are not one to one, whereas the carrying angle for Australopithecus afarensis is like firmly in the middle of the human range. But more importantly, they note here, they say in summary, the knee of the small hadar hominid shares with other Australopithecines a marked obliquity of the femoral shaft relative to the bicondylar plane, but in all other respects, it falls outside of the range of modern human variation or barely within it. So yes, because it's not a modern human, it's its own thing, right? But it's very close to the human range to the exclusion of the African apes. It's not in their range at all, something they would have pointed out here. Um, but finally, and this is perhaps the most important part, is the cortical bone distribution, something contested bones completely neglects to mention, but is absolutely critical because it is the joining factor that is necessary for bipedality and does necessitate bipedality based off of stress and loading and is similar in humans and also for the afarensis to the exclusion of spider monkeys, orangutans, and chimpanzees, right? So moving on, they discuss the reconstruction and function of Lucy's hip is contested. This is a classic for young earth creationists. They like to show the Nova documentary of them using a buzz saw on a plaster cast of Lucy's pelvis in order to make it look like they force fit it into the human shape. Let's see what they have to say. There are very few Australopithecine hips preserved in the hominin fossil record. The South African Australopithecus africanus hip, Lucy's half hip bone are the best preserved specimen. The overall structure of these hips is similar. They both display shorter, broader pelvises reminiscent of humans. Apes have taller, narrower pelvises, yet they also display features that are different from humans and living apes. Paleo experts have said that the Australopith hips do not appear intermediate between ape and man. They are unique. This is partially true. There are aspects of the Australopithecus pelvis that is unique to humans, although as you can see in the background, and we'll hopefully see more momentarily, the similarities are very clear between humans and Australopeds. Paleo experts have so okay, to that. Anatomist Owen Lovejoy, who's responsible for reconstructing Lucy's pelvis, affirms this in the journal Gate and Posture. The hip of Australopithecus is thus not intermediate between apes and humans, but instead is instead a unique mosaic. This is true, but it's still a biped right? And it can be a unique mosaic and also be on the human lineage. Intermediate would imply that it's a perfect mix of the morphologies of some kind of knuckle walking or, you know, arboreal quadrupedal palm grade, prone grade ape and humans, but it's not. It shares traits of both, but it also has its own unique aspect, right? That's, that's what that's saying. 
But the question remains, was Lucy's pelvis made more for walking or for climbing and suspensory behavior? Okay, guys, I thought you said it was knuckle walker though, right? You see how they pick and choose? They don't actually hold that Lucy was either a knuckle walker or a suspensory animal. They hold both simultaneously, which is impossible, right? You cannot, I don't think they know the difference between the suspensory clamoring locomotor style that orangutans have versus what chimpanzees and gorillas have, which is terrestrial knuckle walking with arboreal capabilities. These things are like totally different. Um, some parts of the hip, okay, the hip was found crushed and broken into 40 pieces. Some parts of the hip were intuitive to reconstruct while other parts were not as easy to restore. For instance, it took Lovejoy six months to painstakingly reconstruct the sacroiliac joint, which joins the hip bones together with the sacrum in the middle of the back. The sacrum is the lowest part of the spine located between the hips. It connects the hip bones together between the spine. The way the sacrum connects to the hip bone is a critical aspect of the pelvis, et cetera, et cetera. They talk about how it's really important for walking. And then they say, the orientation of the sacrum can be used to infer the presence of the lower spine curvature, lobomor lordosis. And then they say, the problem with Lucy's sacroiliac joint is that it was severely damaged and determining the original orientation was difficult. And then they put in parentheses, if not impossible. <laughs> The hip was pressed into the sacrum, causing the two parts to become fused together during fossilization, which distorted the contact between the hip and the sacrum, the sacroiliac joint. This caused the sacrum to rotate forward 90 degrees with respect to the hip bone into an anatomically impossible position. Thus, the original orientation of the sacrum, like many other aspects of Lucy's pelvis, is contested among paleo experts. Stern and Sussman write, and then Stern and Sussman basically make the argument that the uh, ilia, or the blades of the pelvis, are more coronally oriented. Um, and that it's difficult to do a reconstruction if you don't have the sacrum and the innominate on one side of the pelvis. And then they quote Ella Bin saying that uh, you need to have um, like enough of the material to actually reconstruct it in a proper way. They're basically saying the same thing. Of course, Ella Bin, as we saw earlier, is totally down with the lumbar lordosis occurring in Australopithecus afarensis, but they do not quote her for that. There's a sentence in here that says the reconstruction of a critical pelvis feature, the sacroiliac joint, therefore depends on the researcher's methods and assumption. No, it does not. It depends on how they can be reconstructed in a biomechanically feasible way, the parts of whatever piece of morphology we're looking at. Other aspects of Lucy's pelvis are contested as well. When looking at the human hip from a top view, they're basically talking about the angle of the iliac blades. Um, the iliac blades look like uh, the airplane steering yoke, and in living apes, they stick out to the side like the handlebars of a scooter. There's a Stern and Sussman um, classic picture, classic figure of this. And then they quote uh, Stern and Sussman here saying, the fact that the anterior portion of the iliac blades face laterally in humans, but not in chimpanzees is obvious. The marked resemblance of AL288-1 to a chimpanzee is equally obvious. Even allowing for postmortem distortion in the middle of the iliac crest, Lucy's hip it is impossible to obtain an orientation comparable to humans. Then they finish off by saying, the bottom line is that they're comparing competing views regarding the reconstruction of the function of Lucy's half hip bone and sacrum. This makes it difficult to infer the posture and locomotory behavior for Lucy. Locomotor, excuse me, behavior of Lucy. Lovejoy reconstructed the pelvis in a way that reflects bipedal locomotor behavior, just like that of modern humans. However, other paleo experts like Schmidt and Hossler reconstruct Lucy's pelvis somewhat differently. They claim the pelvis reflects arboreal locomotory behavior as well as bipedal. Again, you guys, I don't know how many times I have to stop and say this. They describe their reconstruction as thus. Overall, the broader pelvis tends to be more laterally and the more laterally oriented iliac blades would produce more favorable insertion sites for climbing muscles in the more heavily built males. Then they say the paleo experts insist that Lucy's hip bone does not reflect human upright posture and human gait as Lovejoy and Johansson claim. The hip of Lucy, like almost every other critical aspect of afferences, is contested among paleo experts. So let's talk about the pelvis for a second because obviously this is uh, pretty important with regard to locomotion. Now in the case of a chimpanzee, this is what the pelvis looks like. We have really tall iliac blades, right? The blades of the pelvis are really tall, um, from the superior to inferior uh, directions. It doesn't have very much of a bowl shape in the center, right? This is because it's situated like this in the animal. Here's the coccyx back here and the sacrum. The sacrum is trapped pretty well between the sort of upper portions, the superior portions of the ilia, and um, they're oriented coronally. So that means they're they're flat. This is what they were just talking about. It looks like the steering wheels of a handle, or the handlebars of a, uh, like a scooter or a motorbike. Now we can compare that to the human pelvis, which looks like this. So together, they're quite different. And in the human pelvis, despite having all of the same bones, the bones are oriented in a different way. It's got a very large bowl shape to it. This in particular is a female pelvis. This is so that the baby can come through during pregnancy, right? We have very short ilia. The blades of the pelvis are very short and squat. The whole thing has kind of been squished like that. And um, 
You can also see from the top, we have these laterally oriented, um, or sorry, excuse me, sagittally oriented iliac blades that go forward to backward. And of course, a very broad sacrum here in the middle. So this is Lucy's pelvis. <laughs> Which do you think that it looks more similar to? The human pelvis or the pelvis of a chimpanzee? It's a pretty easy guess. Right? Now, the reconstruction of Lucy is criticized by young Earth creationists all the time. They say that this pelvis is artificially reconstructed to look more human-like, but the truth is you actually can't get it into a chimp-like shape. Because if you take this bone and you want to pull down the sort of ischium, the lower part of the pelvis here, and you want to pull it downward, as would be the case in a chimpanzee, to achieve this non-bowl shape to it, right? You actually have to add more bone because if you just pull it with what you have, you're going to end up with a big gap between the pubic synthesis and babies are literally just going to fall out of this thing, right? It's anatomically impossible to lengthen the ischium to the degree that you would need to achieve a chimp-like anatomy and <laughs> simultaneously fuse it at the synthesis, right? That's just, it's just not going to work. There's not enough bone to work with. Um, now from the top, right, you can see what Stern and Sussman are arguing about how it's got this sort of coronal orientation here, right? more similar, or not even more similar to a chimpanzee, but just more intermediate between humans and Australopithecus afarensis when you're comparing the two, just from a sort of vertical view. But nevertheless, it maintains other extremely derived aspects of its morphology. It, like humans, have been squished, got this ilia, um, ilium, excuse me, that's kind of in between being coronally and uh, sagittally oriented. But the sacrum is very broad. Now they complain about the reconstruction of the sacroiliac joint, but there really isn't a way to reconstruct this into a quadruped. It really just depends on how efficient at bipedality this is going to get. And that's what contested bones completely just decides not to talk about, is what the argument is really about. Like they're not arguing whether or not it's a biped or a quadruped. They're arguing whether it's a committed biped or a habitual biped. That's what this comes down to. But I think it's interesting that the section on Lucy's pelvis is so short, right? Like they really don't have much to argue with here. This thing just looks like the pelvis of a biped, right down to the anchoring sites for powerful gluteal muscles here on the sides. Interestingly enough, Lucy's pelvis also has this sort of lateral flare to it that's unique just to the species. Again, sort of recapitulating what Owen Lovejoy was saying about how it's not just a mix of human traits and the traits of something similar to a chimpanzee. It's got its own unique flavor as well. The next section is titled Suppression of Competing Interpretations of Lucy's Kind. Outside of the paleoanthropological community, the world has been persuaded that Lucy was essentially human from the neck down and walked like we walked and left the late holy footprints. It's unfortunate that so many people are unaware of the ongoing controversy and the fact that a large fraction of paleo experts reject Lucy and her kind as a habitual biped. You see how they just snuck that in here, right? Who is rejecting Lucy as a habitual biped? The argument is whether it's habitual or facultative, not not bipedal or quadrupedal. Like I just said that, but they still, I, I just can't stop myself because it really makes me so mad. This is such a dishonest thing to do. And so blatantly so. Like they think, uh, like they thought that a, a PhD student in biological anthropology, a bespectable one, wouldn't sit down and read this for herself. Regarding afarensis, paleo experts Cartmill and Smith acknowledge that virtually every observation has been called in question by one side or another from Stern in 2000. Paleo experts Sarmiento, Mitchell, and Meldrum described the two competing views in the Journal of Comparative Human Biology in 2012. Thus, the two opposing views of Australopithecus behavior still prevail to this day crystallized. One, Australopithecus was a habitual terrestrial biped unlikely to practice arboreal behaviors, or two, Australopithecus was a part-time terrestrial biped that commonly engaged arboreal behaviors. Like, they just put it in the book. This is completely, this one sentence is just completely in contrast and at odds with what they just said in this paragraph. Again, it's not a quadruped biped argument, which is what they need it to be. Okay, the first view command contends that Lucy's kind was different from other apes and upright walking hominid with the human looking body. The second view is that they were essentially apes, habitual tree dwellers like apes living today. That's so dishonest. That's just, let's, let's just read that again. I want you to appreciate this as much as I do. Okay, here's what the paleo experts had to say. Thus, the two opposing views are, one, Australopithecus was a habitual terrestrial biped unlikely to practice arboreal behaviors, and two, that it was a part-time terrestrial biped that commonly engaged in arboreal behaviors. Notice that bipedalism is critical to both 
of these ideas, both of the two prevailing views. Then they turn around and characterize it like this. The first view contends Lucy's kind was very different from other apes, an upright walking hominin with a very human looking body. The second view is that they were essentially apes, habitual tree dwellers like the apes living today. That is not at all what the paragraph proceeding said. Unfortunately, the public has only heard the first view, despite many findings that support a predominantly arboreal interpretation of Lucy's kind, having been reported in numerous leading peer-reviewed scientific journals. At risk of overkill, we summarize the, below the nine features of afarensis to make it clear Lucy's kind was an ape. Let's assess these together. One, body size and limb proportions of an ape. False. We already showed that Lucy's limb proportions are more similar to humans than they are to chimpanzees. Then they say, and do they have any citations here? 66, 67, and 69. 66, that's from 1979. 67, that's from 1979. And the last one is 69 from a video. So no, they do not provide any sources for this. So part one, I just put wrong. Number two, skull, face, and jaw of an ape. Johansson further acknowledges that Lucy's head and face look like an ordinary ape with the brain size of a chimp. Her brain is actually larger than a chimp's, although not by much. Chimps range from 300 to 400 cc's usually, and Lucy's um, also pits max out at around 550. Still larger. Um, Lucy's species show a clear sagittal crest. Only some of them do, and it would be the male, so it's really dependent on your interpretation there. Um, but more importantly, it's intermediate, right? So the skull, face, and jaw is not of an ape. The teeth are unique. The prognathism is intermediate. The brain size is small, but not chimp level. Um, and it, it lacks many of the tr sort of traditional features that we assign to uh, your, your classic um, modern day apes. Most notably, of course, is the location of the foramen magnum, which is something that they just didn't mention at all. Take a moment and appreciate that. We haven't touched on the foramen magnum yet. Maybe they will. Then they go, they know upon careful examination of Lucy's kind, they talk about the jaw, they talk about the teeth, they talk about the ear, um, and then just conclude that it's of an ape. Three, soldiers of an ape. So the shoulder blades or scapulae are scarce in the fossil record. This I put intermediate because while the shoulder blade is more oriented dorsally, meaning it's probably more similar to our arboreal apes, it's not a knuckle walker shoulder blade, this is for sure. They say the rib cage of an ape, the barrel shaped rib cage that follows the contour of our curved hip bones. If you want to say that the rib cage is ape like because it's barrel shaped, then you're going to have a hard time with some of the later hominins that these guys accept as human, right? Homo erectus, very barrel like rib cage compared to later humans, uh, later Homo sapiens. Neanderthals, very barrel shaped rib cage compared to Homo sapiens as well. The spine of an ape, this is just blatantly false. Elebin is in support of lumbar lordosis, and we showed several different uh, sources as to why this is a very reasonable expectation to have, particularly with um, regard to the rest of the suite of characteristics that Australopithecus afarensis have. Uh, now, the sources that they use for this one, because I'm always interested in the ones that they're just blatantly wrong, the rib cage of an ape, like, it's, it's definitely basal compared to Homo sapiens, but the spine... Not so. So we have source number 85. This is from 1977. Awesome. To up to 1983 or 82, excuse me. And they have, that's the, oh, they have 88, which is from ooh, 2015. Reassessment, Lucy's back. Reassessment of the fossils associated with AL288-1. So what did they say? Oh, this is the, uh, this is the baboon vertebra. Yeah, we've been over this on the channel. So baboon vertebra was included in the original I think it was cervical, cervical vertebra that they don't say. But I think it was cervical, included with the original cervical vertebra assigned to uh, Australopithecus afarensis. And it's not surprising why they look very similar. The fact that you almost can't tell the difference between a, a baboon cervical vertebra, Australopithecus, and then later Homo is not helping the case that these guys present, which is that humans are not primates. But fortunately for us, the fact that we've had other bones slip in from other oh gosh, families slip into hominin remains means that every additional subsequent and even past collections have been scrutinized heavily to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, we always are thankful for these kinds of things. The hip of an ape, <laughs> I put Lamau here because that's obviously ridiculous. It's just for another comparison. We got these two. These two are analogous, you guys, to the exclusion, by the way, 
of this. They're just saying these two are more similar than either is to this, which is um, pretty silly. Again, there's too many derived aspects of the Australopithecus afarensis hip. It's got the short squat ilium that's moving into a sagittal direction. Um, it's just overall bull shaped. You didn't, I didn't mention this here, but it's got an anterior inferior iliac spine, which is again, only a human characteristic. You can see my bipedality video for that. Okay, so the hip of an ape, they, their explanation for this is just that there's too many reconstructions so that they just say it's an ape. Like this whole paragraph is just like, yeah, people argued, so it's an ape. Okay, <laughs> the hands of an ape. I put, I'm okay with this. I put basal here, even though they didn't talk about the manipulative capabilities of Australopithecus afarensis's hands, I do maintain that the curved phalanges at least would have allowed again for the arboreal behaviors. The feet of the ape, I put LOL. That's absolutely ridiculous. They said, uh, there are approximately 50 foot bones, none found physically connected to even a partially intact skeleton. They're Simon to Lucy's kind, afarensis is therefore questionable. Okay, what about the Dakika child? Again, they just don't care about that evidently. Just like the hand bones, many of the recovered feet bones appear distinctly ape-like. The bones of only partially preserved foot bone is described as long curved and heavily muscled. Yeah, this is true, but then it's also got an inline halix and three arches in the foot. Uh, they continue downward and basically they're just repeating what they've already said and then they complain about the footprints again. The knee joint of an ape, a preserved knee joint attributed to Lucy's kind reveals a high carrying angle. The high carrying angle is also seen in modern humans. Then they say, yeah, but because we find it in, <laughs> in other apes, it therefore means that it is not indicative of a biped. Uh, this is ridiculous, but again, I would like to just show you how similar these things are. Like, I'm not normally a fan of the eyeballing idea, but sometimes you really can appeal a bit to it just because these things are just, this is just ridiculously similar. Right? You can't make an argument that these things aren't sharing a lot here. And they come to the conclusion that Lucy's kind is mostly ape. I put okay. Contrary to the human-like representations of Lucy promoted by the media and found in textbooks and museum displays, the actual fossil evidence consistently shows that Lucy and her kind are not transitional forms. Australopithecus afarensis was an ordinary ape, very similar to chimpanzees and gorillas. Esteemed paleo expert Richard Leakey writes in his book, Origins considered, the Australopithecus species almost certainly were not adapted to the striding gait and running as humans are. Here are the adaptions that tree, to tree climbing that can be seen in Australopithecus afarensis. Again, like this is just okay, right? Like they're doing the Robert Sepper thing here where you can't have two kinds of locomotion. It's either human-like bipedality or full arboreality to the writers of contested bones, but not, interestingly enough, to all of the people that they keep citing to support their idea. They're like, see, they agree. There's some arboreality. Therefore, it was fully arboreal. No, that's not how this works. That would be like looking at a frog and saying, see, it spends some time in the water, therefore it's marine. Right? It's just, it's so stupid. And it's not in accordance with the morphology. And it's not in accordance with the trackways either. Okay, so they say, um, an arrow points to a distinctly ape-like anatomy, long curved fingers and toes, large piece of form, funnel-shaped thorax, cranially oriented shoulder joint, relatively short hind limbs. All these features are characteristic of today's tree dwelling apes. You'll notice they just left out all of the non- uh, characteristic traits of an arboreal quadruped or suspensory animal. Like they just left out all of those there. Okay, then they do another quote. What we see in Australopithecus is, this is from uh, Peter Schmid, is not what you would see in an efficient bipedal running animal. I agree, no one is saying that Australopithecus afarensis is running any marathons. I oh, love joy might. Virtually every aspect of Lucy's skeleton and the bones attributed to the species as a whole reflect the anatomy of a true dueling ape. It, it sounds like I'm being repetitive here, but that's just what the book says, right? Like, uh, they continue onward and onward. They're mad because people are saying that it looks human as if there were no controversy to speak of. Yeah, except there, there isn't much. I hope that I've shown to you today what the literature actually says. What is the current state of things? <sighs> hmm, we'll continue. The biggest surprise in this chapter turns out to be that homo bones were found among the afarensis bones as Johansson originally reported. He initially described the Hadar site as mixed bone beds containing diverse taxa. Now, and notice that it's not homo sapiens, right? Homo bones, not homo sapiens. Like homo habilis can be found in some of these areas. Um, they go on to say, man, no blood, homo bones, human footprints, etc., etc. Attributed the bones to Australopithecus afarensis. They, dis they actually dispute sexual dimorphism, which blows my mind because there's just a ton of support for Australopithecus afarensis being sexually dimorphic. Um, 
in my opinion, at least, but what do I know? I just study sexual dimorphism for my master's degree and now for my PhD. Okay, review papers have summarized the history. They're just, okay, in chapter 11, we will discuss in detail the more, the third competing view of Auschwitz afferensis, which accepts Johansson's original observation of two separate genera being present at Hadar. We agree with the numerous paleo experts that Johansson's sexual dimorphism theory is not credible. This is because the nature variation is too great to reflect within a single mammalian species. Auschwitz afferensis appears to be a mixture of bones belonging to different species. <laughs> Okay, so this is like, this is the joke, right? It's too transitional. <laughs> the full story about Lucy and her kind uh, that the public has not been told will be found in chapter 11. In chapter 11, we will show that the bones that appear to be human really are human and need to be distinguished from Australopithecus ape bones. We conclude that Lucy and her kind are not a credible evolutionary link between ape and man. The majority of the bones are class that are classified as Lucy's kind are pure ape. Afarensis is an extinct population of apes, very similar to the chimpanzees and gorillas. Uh, and then this latest development section for 2017 just talks about the trachea's footprints. I've talked enough about those. I don't think that they are footprints, but if they are, I even more don't think that they're hominids. Some of them are like that big. So, oh boy, uh, this was an exhausting chapter. It took me like a day to do this. As you can then it's changed day and night cycle at least once. I find this chapter abhorrent. I think that it's one of the more dishonest chapters in Contested Bones, and it only gets worse from here. At least with, you know, some of the Neanderthals and things like that, you can you can make a reasonable case that they are human-like. But to argue that Australopithecus is not a hominin, and more specifically that the parts that you like to be human, that you find compelling to be very human, things like the knees and stuff like that, that those just are human bones, but then the parts that you find are more apish are just ape bones, despite the fact that no Homo sapiens bone has ever been found in the same strata as an Australopithecus afarensis bone. It's just a pipe dream, right? Like, And they're willing to just show you selectively which literature they feel is, is best in support of their case to the expense of everything else. They don't mind doing that. Uh, and that's going to continue to be the theme in Contested Bones, especially when we get to the bones of the middle type, because as you just saw here, they have absolutely no qualms with going, nope, it's too transitional, it's a mix of, of ape and human bones. Which leads me to ask you, the viewer, who has suffered through this multi-hour escapade into um, into Contested Bones' Australopithecus Afarensis chapter, what would count as a transitional form in the hominid fossil record to these guys? What would count? Now, you might think, this is easy. A single, you know, mostly articulated or at least partly articulated skeleton that shows the human aspects and articulation with the ape aspects. That would show once and for all that, you know, these things are real animals and they occupy a very transitional space. And to that I say, wait till we get to Australopithecus sediba. They don't care. <laughs> so my gentle and of course very modern apes, um, to kind of round this off, Australopithecus afarensis is truly representative of a transitional species in the sense that it occupies one of the many stopping points from a generalized Mycenae ape to modern humans. Of course, in the realistic world, all species are transitional species because all creatures are still under the effects of the world around them and are moving in one direction or another, changing from their current form as populations shift in response to uh, the rate mutations and which of these mutations are selected for. Humans today are weird because natural selection doesn't impact us as much as it used to. But Australopithecus afarensis is very much a midway point in a lot of aspects of its morphology. And in others, it's much more derived than what came before it. I would argue that with regard to bipedality, Australopithecus afarensis is not a midway point. It's well on its way to being fully human as it were. Um, and in others, it's much more primitive, like in its brain case size. But what is certain is that this thing is a real animal and that its morphology tells the tale of an, an animal with a very interesting locomotor repertoire that was certainly bipedal on the ground and may have still engaged in arboreal behaviors. But we're going to learn more as we continue to pull fossils up out of the ground. I hope I have shown you, you know, with the literature that I've presented, uh, that Contested Bones has really done a bad job here with this chapter, and I encourage you to go check the literature for yourself and tell me if I'm wrong. So I do hope to see you next time, because next time we're you're, we are challenging, uh, tackling my favorite hominin, which is Artipithecus rabidus. And in the meantime, I do hope you take care of yourselves.